this one's called. When I uh, first discovered Motorhead, you know, back in the 70s, because to me that was that was the gateway band. For other people it's going to be different, but for me it was that band, Motorhead. I didn't know it was extreme music at the time and nobody was calling it that, but that was really it. After that I was always looking for the dirtier, faster, noisier bands that I could find. And it went on from there really, you know, so. I mean at the time, the kind of heavy metal, I guess people call it new wave of British heavy metal, although that wasn't, that doesn't cover everything. But some of that stuff I wasn't for me because it was too clean, you know, not nasty enough. Whereas Motet was, you know, so, so it was that for me really, you know. That's where it kind of started. I would definitely say Scum. That was a fucking monumental album as far as altering my perspective on music, you know? Because I'd already been into New York City Mayhem and I heard Repulsion and Terrorizer or, you know, Hellhammer, Apocalyptic Raids, stuff like that. You're like, wow, what the fuck are these guys doing? It was so fucking necro. It was so, like, amazingly simple and crude, but it, it was effective. And that had an influence on me. Well, there was a time where I thought uh, Nuclear Assault had one of the fastest beats, you know, and that's what I always kind of gauged what Extreme would be, would be by the, the riffing or, and the, the speed and, and stuff, you know. There was speed metal, thrash metal, it kind of obviously came from classic metal. It, it evolved into that. So to me, it would be death metal and grindcore, you know. Earache, mosh, one through whatever. <laughs> um, to me, that was like the beginning of the extreme music. And for me, Carcass, Symphonies of Sickness was... That was the one thing where I where I, where I listened to it and went, what the fuck was that? Marinate on it for a couple days and then came back and listened to it and I never stopped. To me, from that moment on, that was the greatest extreme album of all time. Uh, still to, to this day, it's, it's still my favorite. It has this very haunting vibe that really nails home what's portrayed on the cover. Disturbing and fucked up, but still artistic, you know, not just you know, pig sounds and fucking, you know, toilet bowl sounds and, and a wall of noise, which is cool too and has its own place, but symphonies of sickness, you know, it really was a symphony of sickness to me. <laughs> I got spiritual healing on cassette, like right when it came out, before I ever even heard Slayer, which is weird. Like, uh, um, I hate to say it, because it's like, you know, I've always had this weird thing in my subconscious or in the back of my head that says if everybody else is into it who cares you know like you'll hear it later <laughs> you'll hear it at some point like check out this other thing first or whatever and so you know um god i was late to the game with a, a, a few bands like that you know like i heard iron maiden and was way in iron maiden before i ever heard metallica even though I got into metal when they were both doing shit, you know. I guess Quiet Riot Metal Health was my first tape, <laughs> 1983 or whatever. <laughs> that was my first actual, my mom got it for me for my second communion <laughs> gift. <laughs> I was like six or seven years old when I first heard Kiss. I seen them on uh, the TV show and uh, I just thought it was the coolest thing. You know, I liked the heavy guitars and stuff and since then I kind of got um, you know, went the normal path of like getting into stuff like uh, ACDC and then, um, you know, Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, some of the early like pre, I call it kind of pre-poser stuff like, you know, early Motley Crue and Rat and stuff like that. Like I, just stuff that had heavy guitars in it. And then I started getting into like hearing um, Phantom. I picked up um, Welcome to Hell on Picture Disc back then. And that was just like the evilest thing I ever heard. And then I started listening to stuff like, well, I heard a lot of stuff on radio. There was a radio station called WMSC in New Jersey. And they would play like everything from like Iron Maiden to, um, you know, Hellhammer, Merciful Fate, uh, Fate's Warning, all this stuff. And I just remember hearing all these like underground bands there and really, really getting turned on by them. I mean, I, I remember, um, you know, 
hearing Merciful Fate and just not know what the hell's going on, you know, and hearing the early Metallica, like the stuff off of Kill 'Em All and just hearing those, those guitars, you know, crunching and stuff and just the aggression in the music. And just it just grew from there. It's kind of like a um, steady thing. And then I, I think probably the turning point for me musically, though, would be I think when I heard like, Slayers, Hell Awaits, and like Possess Seven Churches, it was just like that was something like the next step, you know, even heavier and stuff. And then once I got into tape trading a little bit later, probably around, I think I started around 80, 87 or something with tape trading, it was all over. And once I started hearing bands like Pap Smear, Master, um, you know, early death like demos and stuff like that, it was just like I knew that my future was in creating you know the most brutal stuff possible it was a very abrupt transition uh, I, was, I was like 11 or 12 it was 1987 i was you know watching mtv and i'd kind of transition from like run dmc and ll cool j and the beastie boys into like uh like the first cinderella album was a big one uh ozzy tribute was a big record at the time the white snake self-titled the first poison album and, um, you know, I'd heard maybe like Iron Maiden or whatever, but then I did one of those uh, 12 tapes for a dollar you send away and you become a member of a record club. I'm sure this is all extremely archaic for anybody that's like under 20 years old. But anyway, they sent you 12 tapes in the mail and to me at 11 years old, 12 tapes was like, holy shit, this is like infinite music. And um, the last two tapes that I sort of saved for the end were Master of Puppets uh, by Metallica, obviously, and Peace Sells But Who's Buying by Megan. And, you know, I went through and I heard, listened to Wasp and Quiet Riot and whatever else there was. And I was like, oh, this is really cool. And then I put on Master of Puppets and I was like, wait, what? And it was totally shocking and exhilarating and sort of dangerous sounding, you know, especially to a little kid. Um, and very quickly I kind of was like well I guess I don't need this like poison tape anymore <laughs> like this is gonna just go in the trash <laughs> and uh, you know from Metallica and then Megadeth it escalated very quickly you know Anthrax, Slayer, Exodus, S.O.D., Testament, Celtic Frost, Venom, Bathory, Sodom, Creator, Possessed, Death uh, and it was just sort of like a quest to find the next heaviest, more and more intense band, you know, and um, by the time, uh, you know, by the end of 1989, it was, you know, very much like death, obituary, napalm death, terrorizer, uh, carcass entombed, it was still like Sodom and Creator were still kind of hanging out, but it, like within that two year period, it was kind of like all I thought about, you know, aside from like masturbating because I was 12. But uh, aside from boobs, like that was literally all I thought about was like, what's the fastest band? Who's faster? Who's heavier? Probably around 10th grade. Um, I had just listened to like basic stuff, pop and rock and stuff my dad showed me um, through my whole entire life. And um, when I hit 10th grade, I met a guy that, uh, that we sort of bonded over video games and stuff. And he started showing me stuff like Decapitated and uh, Vital Remains and weird stuff like this band Battle Lore that their whole entire thing is Lord of the Rings so they all dress up as orcs and shit on stage um, and then I just fell down the rabbit hole each year it was just finding out more and more stuff I met some guys that got me into like punk and hardcore and you know then I just listening didn't really suffice man I just started wanting to play it you know and figure it out from there and I'm still fucking trying to figure it out. <laughs> Probably the first death metal record that I, I was really drawn to was um, At the Gate, Slaughter of the Soul. Um, I mean, I guess that was like the first of the older, like more uh, 90s death metal because um, there were some more modern bands at the time, like uh, in the early 2000s that were kind of um, crossover from death metal and hardcore and the sort of world, like Black Dahlia Murder, for example. Um, and then I... S from those modern bands, I kind of traced it back to the bands that they were influenced by. So like Morbid Angel, Dissection, At The Gates. One Christmas, I got um, Gore Obsessed by Cannibal Corpse in my stocking. My sister put it in my Christmas stocking. And I had liked like the Misfits and stuff before that. And 
like like all sorts of like punk and all that stuff, you know, and um, like Pantera, you know, too, like stuff like that, Metallica. And um, but then I heard that CD and I remember I opened it. And I was like, what is this? I was really little. And I was like, what is this? What is this art? It's insane. Like, it's the guy with the skin. It's like a skin cape. And it's like on, top of, on, the, on the cover of that Gore Obsessed. And uh, I remember putting it on. And I don't think I'd heard death metal, really. And I was very little. And um, I remember not understanding what was happening at all. And I was like... I was like, what is this? It's just noise. I was like, this is just noise. And then it, like, I kept listening to it, and I was like, this is actually the coolest thing I've ever heard. And from there, I just got obsessed with it. And um, I got, I used to download music on, like, LimeWire back in the day, like, a long-ass time ago. And I would just download everything. I remember I stumbled upon Dying Fetus, um, the first three Decapitated records. I always talk about those, and I found those. I downloaded those on LimeWire and, um, or whatever the hell I was using. And, uh... Then that, that's how I kind of got into stuff. I just, you know, started going to shows, started going to death metal shows, and just grew from there. And now it's a big part of my life and will always be. Back at, like, 14, 15 years old, I had some friends that I grew up down the street from um, that were getting me in, into all kinds of bands, like Dying Fetus, Suffocation, Deicide, Cannibal Corpse. And, um, you know, what that led to was me also finding bands on the Internet. Um, also finding out bands that were local just by doing like Google searches and things like that. And um, yeah, from there it just got heavier and heavier as my taste like grew. And uh, yeah, it just, just hasn't changed a bit. It's not a phase. I've been around for a while in the seventies, man, the late seventies. But even before that, I guess, cause I had two older brothers. They turned me on to Alice Cooper, uh, you know, the Stones, the Beatles, all that stuff. So. Elton John, even early stuff. The Who, though, was like one of my favorites. Alice Cooper and The Who. So that's uh, that's probably when. But like being a Kiss fan, it was, that was the band that I found myself. You know, m my brothers didn't care for it. They were older already. From like buying magazines with Kiss in them, you know, I would see like this little thing about the Sex Pistols or The Clash or Ramones, you know. So I started buying all those magazines and then started buying all those albums. Because I was like, this is, looks fucking crazy, you know? And I just fell in love with that type of music, you know? I and mean, of course I like metal and, you know, too, but that stuff is like, you know, it, in my soul. Definitely in 2011, I was 13. Me and everyone else in Stab Wounds except for our drummer, which we just met a couple years ago. We all started going uh, to hardcore shows and like, like 2010, 2011, 2012, which is when our first band played our first show. Uh, we used to be in a band called Waste of Blood, and um, yeah, I bought a bunch of these seven inches from these bands that would just come through and play. And uh, I remember I bought a seven inch from this particular band. I can't remember who it was, but the bass sounded like a toilet. They had like a bass break, and it just sounded like a toilet. And I was hooked, and I was like, okay, yeah, this is this is heavy, like, because I was in a punk before that, you know. I was in a punk like, and like just like more poppy stuff, and then. Um, yeah, I just got into the heavier stuff. Early 80s, 83, 84. Um, started off with just uh, Black Sabbath and Ozzy Osbourne. And uh, it's sometime in, I think it was 84, 85, um, my friend uh, gave me a uh, tape of Hellhammer. And uh, I really uh, kind of took to Hellhammer. And then from that, he introduced me to Venom and... Um, Man of War, and <laughs> uh, so I, I just enjoyed uh, the extreme way that uh, Hellhammer and Venom especially uh, approached metal music, and um, that's about when I started, yeah, early 80s. Kronos, uh, very much so, and then as far as uh, vocal style and delivery, I was very into uh, uh, Mantis, Death, uh, and Massacre. Cam Lee especially uh, ended up being a, a huge Massacre fan. Fantastic death metal voice. In fact, I think he is, for me, one of the quintessential death metal sounds for uh, for this kind of aggressive music. Just hearing straight heavy metal at the age of 10, and when I say straight heavy metal, I mean, you know, just kind of like your Dio's and, and, and Iron Maidens and Judas Priest. Uh, yeah, I, I was hooked then. 
but then uh, it, as of anything, you know, you get your first taste, you want more and more. So it just got heavier, faster, and uh, so I was I was hooked immediately. There was there was no turning back once uh, once it started. Every all my all my Star Wars and football dreams went away. It turned into heavy metal dreams from then. Uh, early teenage years, 13, 14. Um, discovered death and black metal at the same time, uh, and went to my first. Uh, show at Mayhem Festival 2009 and uh, <clears throat> went to a couple more after that and just was super sold on everything about it, you know, the energy, uh, the crazy fan base, uh, the music obviously. Uh, it's all red. I always sought it out. I thought it was like a hunt. You know, I was like looking for stuff pre-internet too. So you're like going to record stores, going to a library to rent. Like who's going to go to the library? Like, I mean, I wasn't renting books. I was renting cassettes, you know? And I couldn't believe they had like heavy metal and, and speed metal tapes there. So, I mean, that, it was a hunt. It was like a journey to find it all. And I just never stopped. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a fan before I'm a musician, you know? Every musician is. Everyone, you know, no matter who you are, it came from something else and you just do the best you can trying to do your version of it. And so, I mean, with waste, I'm, I'm taking stuff from all different types of music, but just speeding it up. I would say that I started really getting into extreme music uh, when I was about 10 or 11. Um, my dad started uh, listening to like Van Halen more around me and um, Nirvana and uh, he really liked um, old Green Day and uh, some Blink-182 and stuff and so like you know all of those like uh, heavier and faster rock sounds were definitely what brought me to you know try and find more and more heavy stuff and uh, so until I really actually found heavy music like Pantera and Slayer I felt like I was on a quest to you know find heavier music and uh, yeah it wasn't until I found those things that it, it was like oh this is what I'm looking for and I need more of this and then it just you know you go down a rabbit hole after that so I've always been one of those people careful not to stand over the rest of the scene with a big stick as some people think that we might and dictate you know have a have this kind of divine judgment I, I don't care about that you know it's up it's up to the people that are doing it now to do what they think is the right thing to do with it. I'm very neutral on it, you know. Like with all music, some things I like, some things I don't like. That's the nature of things, you know. So, so yeah, I'll just let it be, you know. Um, I've definitely heard a lot of good bands. But there's some really promising stuff out there, definitely. But then there was 10 years ago, you know, and before that. So it's constantly moving, you know, that's a good thing. It's just the fact that it's still relevant, that it legitimizes it, that it's not a flash in the pan thing that just, you know, I mean, who gives a shit about Limp Bizkit now, you know? I mean, I know they're still out there and Fred Durst and whatever, but the point being that it's something that obviously was important enough that it mattered and that I wouldn't have cared if I was wasting my time either way, but yeah, can't deny this. We got some Slayer on in the background, but yeah. Um, as far as how it excited me personally, it just motivated me. Just made me want to do it and put my own stamp on it, because that's important. You gotta have your influences, and then if you take those influences and move them forward and not just imitate it, but say, okay, this is fucking cool, now I'm gonna play it, and then let's see what I can do with it. So I like to think that I helped contribute to the evolution of that music. Eventually what's going to happen is to keep it interesting, you'll bring in more noise or something like that, anything just to push it more to that extreme and make it uglier and harsher. And if that involves having a fucking chainsaw in the background, as long as it's in F sharp or something, that's fine. Instead of making it go in some really bogus, weird direction, they're looking back into the past. And normally I wouldn't be, I, I, I'm usually more about progression, but there's something about looking back in the past, recognizing actual death metal for being what it was, which was an atmosphere and a and just this vibe, and bringing that back um, in their own way. There's a lot of bands doing that right now. You know, I think that's uh, really cool. 
um, you know, just, uh, but then there's stuff like, like Igor, you know, which I think is really cool because it's, it's taking, it's what I feel that we've, my band has done or whatever is taking extreme metal, um, adding things to it that normally wouldn't work really you know or in kind like a first chorus pre-chorus type you know bridge uh traditional song structure format that kind of stuff um you know igor and and his all that gautier's uh, offshoots are super fucking cool um i think that's really neat it's not just throwing a techno beat in with a fucking you know some grindcore part like you know people have done in the past and it's really hard i mean one of the hardest things to do is to seamlessly mix keyboards with death metal you know or extreme metal or whatever so um at the same time i like that you know pushing it to new heights and appreciating the old stuff for what it was and trying to bring back that sound instead of making it something that's palatable. Cattle Decapitation is definitely awesome. Um, I didn't discover them for a few more years down the line, um, but I mean, their stuff is definitely super outside the box compared to some other bands, and I've always appreciated that, uh, especially vocally. Travis Ryan um, has his own thing, and uh, I dig it. I like, appreciate what he does a lot um, and what he's done for the genre as a whole. I've been noticing there's like a rising trend of bands that are kind of reverting to like the old school death metal kind of sound. And that's kind of what I'm all about right now. That's really where all my focus is, like as far as new bands are going. Um, a lot of people are paying attention to deathcore, but I'm mostly paying attention to those kind of bands like Blood Incantation, uh, Gate Creeper, and bands like that, you know. I thought for years it's already been pushed to the limits, like musically, heaviness wise, and I mean, lyrically, whatever, people can come up with the most weird, strange, you can go to outer space or something, or <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, I mean, maybe you go to Mars and start singing about stuff that's gonna happen in the future, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> you get science, science fiction-wise, I don't know. But, I mean, it, it's hard to get heavier, I think. I don't know, I don't know what you're gonna do. I mean, it's like, there's only so many tones you can make, <laughs> as far as we know right now, as human beings as a culture, you know? Uh, obviously, I liked, like Black Sabbath, well, Leonard Skinner and Southern Rock and Classic Rock, and then got into like Maiden and then Ju Judas Priest, and all of a sudden it turned into like Slayer, Possessed, and Exodus, and Destruction, and I think all that stuff's still healthy. I mean, we did that farewell tour with Slayer in 18 in Europe, and it was 20,000 people at every show. <laughs> So that's pretty sick. They retired. So I think it's healthy. I mean, metal in general, like every vibe of it, I think it's doing good, you know? And death metal seems like it's still chugging along. Yeah, I think if you can write a killer hook and a riff and a beautiful rhythmic pattern, people will go home humming that. When they go home, they'll be like, oh, wow, remember that riff? Oh, they'll be humming it all the way home, you know? And it's catchy, you know? It grabs you and you remember that shit, you know? And um, I think that's what obituary does. You know? That's what we try to do. Or not really try, it's just kind of what we do. I mean, literally, riff writing for us, like when I write a riff, it's always by accident. Sometimes it'll be like a sound check on tour. I'll be sitting there like, like sound check. My sound man will be like, hey, you know, make some noise. And I'll, all of a sudden, some riff will come out. Like, oh, crap by accident, and I'll record it with my phone or something nowadays. I just put my phone, I say, okay, wait, hold on, we gotta record that. You know, boundaries have always been pushed. It's when, with death metal, it's like when people take it seriously, you, know, you gotta be out of your mind. These people aren't raping and killing people, you know? Luckily, we don't have, we have lyrics about killing people, and in a fun way, almost like a horror movie would do it. Like, there's a mythology to it, and we create our own fantasy world where it's like, death is fun, you know? And I, I, I'm a big horror freak myself, so it's like, that shit's funny to me. And you gotta be able to separate that. It's the people, it's the quiet ones you gotta watch. They're probably not in a band, they're probably listening to it. But it's not one of those like, you know, explicit lyrics things where like music ain't gonna make someone do that. They're already like wound for that, you know? So I don't, I don't care what people push the boundaries. I just wanna make something clever 
that makes you think, you know, and that's evil at the same time. Well, I'm blown away that people still like this kind of music. Um, I mean, when I was starting Incantation back in 1989. I never, never thought it would last this long. I mean, pretty much. Um, what we start, you start 80, 89. I thought maybe by 95, it would just all be done. You know, no one would care about this kind of stuff anymore, and music would just move on. And in some ways, it did, I guess. But it instead, really, it just kind of like kept kind of mutating a little bit with the times and stuff. But it's kind of interesting because now, 30 years after we started, our style of death metal is more popular, maybe more popular than when it first happened. Because when it first happened, people had no clue to what the hell we were doing. And even in the death metal world, it was like, it was pretty over the top, um, you know. So now it's like, it's almost become more accepted or people kind of understand it. I don't want to sound like rock star and egotistical, but, you know, maybe we were just a little bit ahead of the time without even knowing it. I mean, we didn't think we were, but looking back on it, it's like we just thought that we were playing a style of death metal that everybody hated, which we were fine with. We didn't care because we're doing it because we love it. It's not because we're trying to uh, win a talent contest or winning a popularity contest or any bullshit like that. We were just doing it because we were into it. And um, But it's nice to know that people still give a crap about it these days. And there are there's a lot of great, um, great new bands out there that are, you know, doing good feeling full death metal. I, I say feeling full because I prefer uh, death metal to have some sort of, um, you know, meaning behind it. Not just, not just, um, not just the brutality, not just the uh, speed and the technicality. I think it needs to have, it sounds, it's a cheesy word, but it has to have like a passion behind it. The evolution of death metal excites me because I feel like um, it's a very, boxed in um, genre of like there's very traditional things that whether it's guitar tones or type of drumming or type of vocals um, but I think that it's exciting and fun to take those um, standard elements and see what you can make out of uh, as little ingredients as possible like almost as like you're cooking and you're limiting yourself to a, a very small batch of ingredients and see how many dishes that you can make um, I think that that's fun um, and we do that with Gate Creeper like um, try to in take a little bit more um, outside influences you know and filter it through our sound or through death metal you know and like um, yeah just take different pieces um, from bands that we like um, you know death metal bands that we like and mix in some other you know other influences that people might not expect um, but it, and the end result is still, you know, we're still a death metal band. I think it's a lot of young people. I think there's a lot of the really good bands in the genre, like Camel Corpse, Dying Fetus, all those bands, that, the bands that I love. They're older, and, you know, and they, they have their time. And I think that there's a lot of um, youth, like, getting involved right now. And, you know, like, we, we just played with Sango Sugabog. Like, all those guys are in a bunch of different bands, and um, they're all awesome. And they're and they're having fun. They're having a lot of fun. And um, same with us. Like I feel like you know we're we're doing our thing, but we're having fun with it. And I, there's there's like a youthful energy to it, to the new stuff that's coming out right now. Um, and, and it's also a lot of it's like back to the basics, where stuff isn't stuff isn't like overcomplicated, which I really like. Like there's more of a groove element to a lot of the death metal that's coming out right now. Shows getting a lot crazier. Uh, lot more tighter tour packages and stuff happening and it's cool seeing a uh, big crowd at death metal shows you know like I remember going to shows early on you know as a teenager like 10 years ago and it could be a Saturday night and you might be able to pull like a hundred people but now you know here we are on a Thursday and there's like 300 something people here and it's fucking wild people are going nuts pitting it's uh, everything I want and more when I come to a show. It's been weird as somebody that's been listening to, you know, underground metal or whatever now for, uh, I guess, 30 plus years. Um, it's interesting to sort of see how the scene 
you know, mutates and, and evolves, but also kind of goes backwards in a cycle as well over time. And I think, you know, if you think about metal in general, you know, if, if you want to start it at the first Sabbath album, that's like 50 years ago. So in a lot of ways, so much of what can be done has been done. And, you know, sometimes I feel very cynical and it's kind of like we're all just like watching the light from a star that's already died kind of thing. Um, but at the same time, you know, especially going out and playing with younger bands like we are on this tour, seeing younger kids and how enthusiastic they are and the fact that this kind of music still strikes a chord with, with people um, is really invigorating and it's exciting. Um, you know, as a dude that's in his 40s, you know, like most people, I'm a bit set in my ways, and I've listened mostly to stuff I grew up on. I've, I listen to all kinds of music, though. Like, we listen to all kinds of shit in the van and, you know, at home or whatever. Um, but I just think the fact that, that it's still going is really exciting. If you would have told me in high school that, like, you know, Napalm Death and Carcass and Morbid Angel and all these bands would still be touring, I would have been like, yeah, right, come on, man. Um, but it's great that they are, and I think, you know, especially the last 15, 20 years has probably been the best time to be into metal ever because you get, you know, now it's starting to ebb where there's no more motor, there's no more Motorhead, you know, like uh, Glenn Tipton can't play anymore, there's no more Black Sabbath, but, but about 10 years ago, you could sort of still see all of these progenitor type bands as well as the new up and coming bands and um you know i think people you know they kind of take it for granted that all this stuff is happening concurrently and um you know because they don't know any different and, and that's that's fine but uh, it's just it's been a really cool thing to see the love for the whole the whole lifespan of the genre from Sabbath to Deep Purple to New Wave of British Heavy Metal to you know Proto Metal Thrash Metal Black Death blah, 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 whatever. And, you know, I think it's uh, it's shocking sort of how healthy the underground is in a great, in a great way, though. I think it's maxed out as, as far as, like, pushing the envelope because the only thing really you can do that's sort of more extreme than what we've already seen and what we've seen 30 years ago, really, is stuff that sort of goes beyond the boundaries of taste, you know? Like, making a band about pedophilia, like, uh, that's extreme. It's not good like don't do that I mean I'm not trying to tell anybody how to live their lives but don't fucking do that you know um, aside from like murder necrophilia cannibalism mutilation serial killers I mean like where, what is there from there you know and I think that's kind of been you know the the strength of death metal and also the limitation which doesn't really bother me is that you sort of start out in a corner and there's not really anywhere to go except kind of to mellow out, you know? And it also gets to the point where, especially older bands that have several albums out, you know, if you're really trying to be edgy, it can come off as sort of, you know, kind of sad, like a 40-year-old guy at a frat party, like, hey, my dudes, like, what? let's play beer pong, guys. And, you know, so I think it's, it's kind of a, a weird thing to see a band like, Cannibal Corpse, who's, who's aging very gracefully and still making really good records, but it's just a weird concept for a death metal band, you know? Um, I think that, yeah, anything that's more extreme than what's been done is going to go beyond the boundaries of taste, and especially with, in the climate right now, even if you're like, we're not a Nazi pedophilia band, we're just joking. It's like, this is not the time for those kinds of jokes. Like, that's not funny anymore. You know, it was barely funny, like, when Anal Cunt was doing it in the 90s, and that time has long since passed. So I think uh, it's kind of a, a weird thing, you know, because obviously it's death metal, it's gross, it's offensive, it's upsetting, it's confrontational. And But there is still some kind of line, you know, and I think... We people in the scene have always known that the line exists. Nobody bought an autopsy record and thought, oh, well, clearly these guys are like fucking corpses. Like, of course. Um, 
it was the people on the outside, you know, the Tipper Gores and the Bob Doles of the world who were like, oh, I don't know about these guys. <laughs> um, so we, I think within the metal scene, we've all known that there's a boundary between fantasy and reality, you know. Um, even, you know, in 1982, I don't think people thought Venom were like really sacrificing virgins or whatever. So I, I, I think that as long as you're playing within that sort of realm, then uh, you know you're going to be good. It's just when you, if you're if you're if you're trying to go beyond the boundaries of taste and just sort of doing something that's shocking just to be shocking. I mean, you might get a reaction, but it's probably not going to be the one you want. It's going to be like boycott this band, don't go to their shows, don't fucking sign them, don't distribute their records, kind of thing. You know. There's a lot about the evolution of this genre that excites me. I mean, you know the. Uh, the fact that you could take something that has been like kind of beaten down over the years and uh, reinvent it and and not reinvent it and just continue playing it and honoring the old school, you know, and kids, and new kids, like I'm talking kid kids, you know, 15 year olds and stuff that are like, fuck yeah, have a place in the world, you know, this is, this is sick, this is what I want to do, and they're starting bands, you know, and, and stuff, and we, you know, I, I think, I think it's evolving to being more of like a staple in heavy music again, instead of like, you know, uh, just the, the more popular stuff. Uh, and and it's it's kind of ushering into that popular stuff, and it's really cool because, um, you know, it kind of, for me at least, it started as like, I just really like Bolt Thriller. I just really like Obituary. So let's write some music and play some stuff that, you know, we want to hear, you know? And, um, you know, the other bands like Gate Creeper and Sangosuga Bog and, you know, 200 Stab Wounds and, you know, Mutilatred and, and Creeping Death, you know, like they're all on that same sort of like, hey, we love old school shit, you know, but let's, 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 re let's, let's, let's do it because we want to hear it and let's, let's go. And, and it's just, it's, it's making waves and kids are fucking loving it. And you're seeing old guys coming to shows like telling me, man, I haven't been this happy about a death metal show in 30 years. And then you've got like new kids that are like, you're my favorite band. And I'm just like, holy crap. Like, it is truly evolving. Just how diverse it is overall, because, I mean, there's a little bit of something for everyone within the realm of death metal itself, because, you know, you've got these, uh, there's some bands that do some, like, dissonant, like, doomy type stuff. You have, like, bands that are super extreme and fast, like Oxygen Destroyer. Um, then you've got, like, bands like us and same with Sugabog, you know, that just focus more on, like, the heavy, like, mid-tempo, meaty kind of stuff. Like, there's just a little bit of something for everyone, you know? And most people like a little bit of everything. It's amazing that uh, there's all these young bucks playing old-school metal in general. Like, every one of the guys on this tour have uh, valve tube amps, <laughs> which is sick. I'm like, oh my god, killer! Because I, you know, I'm using amps that are 40 years old, and these guys are using old school amps, and I love it. And uh, I can forced. They're like shh, fucking thrash metal sickness and gate creeper. It is like fucking autopsy and uh, entombed or thrown into a blender, maybe a little modern morph in there, mixed in. They're like. It is like uh, I love it. It's beautiful, and that so that prolongs uh, what's happening in this deal. So we're out with obituary right now. You got slow, heavy death metal. We're speed metal. You got bands that are opening up like completely different styles. So it just it keeps it interesting, I think. And I think what's cool about today is. It was more uh, separated in the past where, you know, you were into one style. Like, if you were a punk, you probably wouldn't integrate with metalheads. And I think the cool thing about this day and age is, like, people can appreciate a lot of different music and be at the same show, and you see less fights, and you see people getting into the same type of, like, different, ty different types of people getting into the same stuff. So it's exciting to see uh, people integrate like that. I mean, Watain's pretty extreme. They do the dead animal stuff or whatever, you know, like... Who would have fucking thought of that, you know? Like, that's crazy. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. I, I, that's a million-dollar question, I guess. Um, I mean, I see bands. There's so much, like, cool, like, creative death metal bands that are coming out right now that um, are really making it interesting. And it's, so, it's cool to see how that genre is starting to, like, 
like mold into something else. What excites me the most about the evolution of thrash is that it's not evolving. Actually, it's uh, it's pretty stationary. I think uh, I think what we're doing and what most bands are doing is pretty. Uh, pretty authentic to what the Bay Area bands were doing back in the day. It's just getting younger, and uh, we're just find, all finding new ways to write our stompy riffs for people to jump around to and have a good time. Death metal just gets like faster and like uh, grosser as time goes on. You know, like uh, early on, you were just getting like fancier guitar riffs, uh, harsher vocals, and stuff like that. But now it's just about like how disgusting sounding you could possibly make it. And uh, it's fucking sick, man. I'm really excited to see where it goes next. I like to think the only way it can go from here is to start writing songs about being really nice to each other. You know what I mean? Just about kissing your neighbor on the lips and uh, making each other bread and all the good stuff in life. With the newer generation where they're, they're taking their set of influences and interjecting them into it, uh, some of the electronic, almost industrial sounding things that are being brought in, um, bands that are not as limited to like being beholden to the thrash lineage of of the scene. I know there's some like old school heads that probably wouldn't, you know, don't appreciate some things that some newer bands are bringing in with electronic influences and things like that. I think that anytime something new comes on the scene, it's it's a uh, a distilled version of all of their influences. You know, you, you grew up listening to the kids growing up now, a lot of hip hop in their life, um, and then the, the old stuff in the metal scene, and then new bands that they're hearing, and they're bringing in those new influences and creating their own take on, on the scene. Uh, maybe they're not extreme metal, but uh, a band like Code Orange is definitely like taking a bunch of influences and, and stirring them up into a pot and setting it to boil and skimming off the top and distilling their influences and creating something different. I love that it's taking so many different shapes, especially for a genre that has for a long time been deeply steeped in tradition. The sonic landscape of it, like uh, the guitars are getting much lower gain, uh, the, the, and I mean the the physical uh, evolution, especially coming from the drummers in that scene, it's just like Jesus, man. It reflects on what like Vitriol's mission statement is, which is having a lot of the heart and aggression and fire behind the music, and hearing new bands that are bringing that energy, that aggression. You know, uh, that's what excites me the most. Uh, we're kind of tripping on. All the young kids with the thrash thing, man. It's like, dude, we we used to look like that almost 40 years ago. You know, white high tops, tight black jeans, bullet belts. You know, cut off fucking venom shirts and stuff. It's like this is great. So it's great seeing the young, you know, the younger, like younger generation of fans. I just met a kid at the merch booth, and I mean, he had freaking pimples all over his face. You know, he's probably I don't know if it's in all ages, but he looked young. Oh, it's a pleasure to meet you. And I'm like, you know, I'm an old guy, but I'm like, he's all in his fucking, he's got his battle vest on covered in, you know, all the pins and, and patches and everything and ready, ready to rock. So I really like watching the young, just the younger generation. Like we're making, and it's been really good. Like every night being with Municipal and, and having, you know, Skeletal Remains and, and Dead Heat, who are, you know, all that's mainly thrash type stuff. So, you know, for us, we kind of stick out, but I like to think in a good way, but I'm getting, um, every night there's a lot of young kids that want to take photos, they're buying a little bit of crowbar merch, they're like, of course they've heard of the name, they just never heard the music, and they're like, man, it's heavy as fuck, it's different, but, you know, because they're young thrash heads like I was. As far as, like, Skeleton Remains, we, the, the sole reason for us being a band is to try to recreate the style that happened in the early 90s, in the late 80s, you know? We're not trying to make something new. We're, we're just, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're just trying to keep it going, I guess is a, the best way to put it. Um, but, I mean, I'm not saying that there's, there shouldn't be bands that do go out and, you know, um, experiment and, you know, take different styles and put it in, you know, into death metal. I, I think it's great, you know, if, 
if it works, it works. And, you know, there's bands that are doing it, and it sounds fucking awesome. I'm a fan, a fan of, but for, like, for, for Skeletal Remains, like, our goal is just to try to recreate what was, you know, like the, the classic era of death metal. When it comes to death metal, for me, especially being a guitarist, you know, I, I like uh, bands that are very, you know, like the riffs are very, not technical, but very thought out. Like, they're not just simple power chords. Like, there's a lot of fucking um, thought into the one riff of the whole song, you know? So, like, for example, Morbid Angel, Monstrosity. I feel like a lot of the Florida stuff was what captured that, like being being able to write memorable, memorable riffs, not just these simple, which is not bad. I love, like, the fucking very simple power chord stuff, but for me, what does it for me are, like, the very thought out riffs, the fucking riffs that are like, you know, extremely hard to play, I guess. Not technical because, I mean, yeah, I guess it can be considered technical, but yeah, I would say I like death, you know, like the later death stuff. I mean, obviously the, the earlier death was a lot more, you know, meat and potatoes, you know, simple stuff, but you know, like the later stuff, you know, like human era. I think I'm just always excited to hear bands doing this specific style of music well, you know? Like that's that's what I'm more. That's what excites me more. Like when when bands push the boundaries and do stuff that's genre bending, that's that's cool. I, I definitely appreciate it. But I guess I've always been the kind of person that really enjoys when bands can execute one thing really well. So any and all of the bands right now that are just playing death metal and doing it really well. I mean, and there's so many of them that just gets me stoked about where the genre is what excites me most about the evolution of it um i don't i don't know if anything excites me about the evolution of it i'm more of the, about the devolution of music in general that's what i've always been about I, I started at a point and just kept going backwards and wanted it more primitive wanted it more primitive so evolution was never of something important to me i'll die so whatever you know and, and when i die i'm a selfish man what can i say when i die the world is done to me so uh, as long as music is raw and devolutionized, that's what I'm more concerned with. Genuine music is, is something that just comes from you naturally, something you're not trying to plot out and, and, and figure out how to do it. It shouldn't have to be uh, figured out and it's like, what can I do that's more extreme than the next guy? You know, it's like, okay, well, that, that's, you know, that it got, for me personally, it got ex extreme as it could get at a certain point. And uh, after that, then you start to forget about the songs, and uh, you still it, now the the as extreme as you can get is having having uh, something to uh, something to grab grab onto. You know, if you, if you're uh, to to be to be very caveman and and I don't know, <laughs> just go back to the caveman days. You, you want you want to have something to grab onto to procreate, right? If you're not grabbing onto anything. What are you doing? You're, you're, you're wasting your time, you're wasting your sperm. I like the evolution because um, I guess when like most people think of metal, you have to, you always envision it like, okay, metal bands are gonna shred and like do like the most crazy, like fastest thing ever. But death metal now doesn't really have to be that. It could just be like anything slow and heavy or it could be something that's just catchy and like, you know, verse, chorus, verse type thing. It doesn't have to be the most crazy, insane song ever, you know? That's what we try to do at least. We're not. We're not, you know, like techie at all. It seems nowadays like the like the expected standard is like a high range, low range vocal, like at the least. Like if you don't have that, then it seems like people aren't as into your band or something like that. Um, so I definitely think that that will continue to be a thing, but you know, people might find ways to go even lower, which at this point is like, I mean, how much lower can you really go? But like the higher range, I think there's a lot of room for innovation in still. Um, so I think it would be cool if some bands would start, you know, experimenting with stuff like that. Not everyone is like trying to reinvent the wheel, but they just might be really good at doing it how it's already been done. Like some bands give you exactly what you want from this shit in just the right way. And maybe you are familiar with the sound, but it's just new and young and rich, I guess. So I'm like mostly speaking on like OSDM stuff, like newer the new wave of this old school death metal shit when I, when I speak on that. Um, but me personally, I'm like a big fan of like cavernous borderline noise 
stuff within metal and I think that there's a lot of uh, directions and innovation there and um, so that's where I look you know primarily people that I associate with and, and, and creative with are always kind of going into this more like harsh inaccessible dreadful dissonant sounding world um, so I think that a lot of stuff is going to go that direction um, but maybe that's just wishful thinking maybe that's just what I want you know I mean I and I see bands like mixing in stuff like in the in the death metal world like even not being not, not like bands that aren't like like noisy like I'm describing um, I see them mixing styles and putting shit together that sounds really good you know I think I think people are like I guess experimentation seems like a little bit more accepted than it used to be you used to have to do things by certain numbers whereas I think that that idea is is less of a thing now I, uh, is the best way to, to kind of explain that good. Like, people don't give a shit about that anymore like they did when I was coming up it, it was different when I was growing up you know I think extreme music will uh, continue to evolve or maybe devolve you know like I feel like bands in death metal now are you know are looking further back into you know the original bands rather than trying to do like a more modern take on it or I guess take influence from the old like original death metal bands and, and you know a little bit of a modern spin on it um, but I think bands like us and our peers um, were kind of taking the old textbook and rewriting it a little bit you know like definitely um, staying true to, to whatever it is but and I think that some people might have a problem with that of like interjecting whether it's like modern techniques or modern production or like more modern influences you know like um, I think there's a little bit of disconnect from our generation and the previous generations maybe that I think um, the, the younger generation which we fall under but there's even much younger bands than us that um, we all like like a much more broad range of music you know, so I think that that's creeping its way into into death metal. Um, I also think that it's a kind of a, a, a thing that's going to happen is that there's going to be a, like some sort of crossover appeal, you know, of like a mainstream, you know, whether it's I don't think that death metal will ever be mainstream, but there's going to be, you know, like us playing with uh, Post Malone or whatever it is, like um, kind of brushes with the mainstream that I think it's going to turn a lot of people on to death metal and hopefully that triggers people to check out other bands that sound like sound like us or um, start their own band, you know, start booking shows, like whatever it is. And because I think that it's up to the younger generation to like pick up, um, pick up and start doing everything that whether it's playing in bands, booking shows, writing f for a website or a magazine or, you know, making videos like Photography. There's a lot of pieces that are at play to keep the the scene alive. So I think the more the more the merrier, you know. I've met some of the kindest, you know, most humane people in this general scene than I have any, you know, compared to anywhere else, you know. So that fact, fact. You know. They're mostly cool people you know it's kind of like a family you know everybody's just really supportive and cool i mean i had a gofundme years ago well a couple years ago uh because i had a liver transplant and the people just supported the fuck out of me it was just you know pretty overwhelming to see that type of thing all these gigs are are the people that come it's just a microcosm of the world outside so they have some things in common they have lots of things not in common you know so that's just the way of things so what I would say is that there are people coming to Napalm gigs that were coming in 89 and 90 and 91. So that gives you the kind of staying power, the dedication that these people have. And the odd thing is, is that, you know, I never take what I do with Napalm or what Napalm does for granted. You know, I'm, I, I know I'm really lucky to be able to do this. And so I always try my best, you know, to make it the best that it can be. But as for the the kind of elevated um, elevated um, profile that some people think is important for me, I don't I don't care about that stuff. It's just never never bothered me. I'm, I just care about 
doing the best that I can for the people that come here or buy the records and, and obviously with the with the human things that we talk about as a band that those those are expressed as they need to be you know and that people hopefully get something from that that's all I care about you know everything else is kind of secondary right? people are the same everywhere no matter where you go there's a bunch of metalheads waiting to see you whether it's fucking here or Japan or fucking the Netherlands or Chile that it's a universal concept of course you might not see that in Nigeria mind you or something, but when I say worldwide, I'm talking about the places where you know you're not going to get killed for doing it, like you know Saudi Arabia, where where there are underground metal bands, by the way, but you know they can't fucking have gigs because of the Wahhabi shit. But um, just the fact that it's a universal thing and that's fucking killer. Because when you travel far away, you get homesick, but then when you see people in Germany or something that look like your buddies back home. You're like, this is the same all over, and that's awesome. I think people are a little more loyal in... I've always felt that way about, um, you know, metal, even, like, you know, punk and uh, fringe genres or whatever, because, I mean, when I was growing up, uh, when I was in high school, it was just like, there was the stoner tree, you know, had a few heavy metalers, you know. I, I was, like, one of three <laughs> freaking people in the metal at my, at my high school, you know, and... So it's always been uh, when people d find each other, you know, and have something in common with with someone else that th that's a little more rare than, say, you know, mainstream country. There's plenty of those fuckers around, but um, it's a, so it's a little more special, you know. I mean, you've seen the meme video or whatever of the two guys, you know, the. What happens when you see another death metal head at a, at a you know the grocery store or whatever, and they're just like, you know, and that's how you know that's how it is. We've all done it. We say, oh, there's look at that guy's shirt. Oh, he likes blah 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 too. But we still somehow stay away from each other. <laughs> I think we all have. I don't know what happened. It's like the '80s or '70s. People, I don't know, people of that generation or whatever. We all have like ADHD or anxiety or depression or something like that and we're all suffering from something and um that's something i've noticed you know with within this scene is it is pretty prevalent but i think that's also comes with anybody that's into art or any kind of artistry or creating any kind of art you know um i don't know it, it's it's interesting it's helped me understand people a lot more um and try to be a little as compassionate or empathetic as I can, you know. Some of them make it real hard. <laughs> Death metal fans are way more alike than they are different wherever we go. I mean, it's an amazing thing for us to be able to travel to anywhere in the world and we feel like we have um, friends there automatically and just, you know, it's a, it's a great thing. It's like, you, you go to a place where there's a, a diff, say, a different culture to some extent, but at the same time, you'll feel so welcome there because of music and because people, you know, respect the music that you play, that it's um, just, just a great, it's a great feeling t to feel that we have friends in almost every country in the world just for the music that we play and that they could relate to it and it means something too. So I mean, it's something that's, very I'm very flattered about you know something that's it's very um, it's an honor you know to be in the position that I'm in with with that sometimes our fans really surprise me and I'm like I don't get where you're coming from at all but I'm glad you're here and then other times I meet people who are fans of the band who are like wow if you lived in the same town like you'd be my best friend you know um, so I try not to make broad generalizations. I mean, hopefully, um, you know, hopefully people enjoy the music and, and they get something out of it. And, and, you know, we try to write music that works on multiple levels. Some people maybe not care about the lyrics. Some people might like the lyrics. Some people might like the music, but not the lyrics or whatever. And, um, you know, so hopefully there's a range of, of experiences people have with it. But ultimately, we just, you know, 
we just make records that we would like and then worry about the rest later, you know? If we go on tour and nobody showed up, we'd be like, oh, fuck, maybe, maybe we screwed up. <laughs> it's weird saying fans, but just like my friends, you know, and people that support us and, you know, um, they all have in common uh, with each other one thing, and that's they want a sense of belonging. And it's been an insane experience to be a part of that. Um, you know, we have a friend um, over in the UK that started us a, um, it's like a, sort of like a fan page, but it's more, it's just a community where we just all have a lot of fun and we talk and everybody, you know, is stoked to just be in each other's lives, you know? And uh, we see that there. And I see that in every single show we play, you know, where it's like everyone's so stoked to be there. Everyone's so stoked to belong to something that, you know, is fun and constructive and and just just great. And that's that's the one thing I noticed that that everybody has in common that we encounter, especially on this, you know, US tour, you know, that everybody is just just happy to be there everybody's happy to be alive and happy to be part of a community that's thriving parents are bringing their kids or grandparents are bringing their grandchildren <laughs> that were at our shows 30 years ago and uh it's just a feeling i think like my first child when he was an infant he would get colic i literally would take him in my car put him in his car seat and put on like morbid tales and literally he would, his colic would go away in about a minute. <laughs> like he would lose that gassy craziness. He'd look at the speaker in the car and go, ah! And like, ah, he'd relax. And I think there's, it's just a, it's a natural feeling. Like it's primitive, you know? And so it doesn't matter in a hundred years, you probably play it for a child and they're gonna go, whoa! You know, <laughs> it's just, I think that's how it is, it's just, an instinct. When you're in your 20s and you got all that angst built up, I mean, that's what you want to hear. So I try to emulate that when I'm playing and I'll like connect with people in the crowd that are younger and you know, that's how they're getting their aggression out. And for me too on stage, but I need to calm the fuck down when I get off stage. I feel like if you're going to a municipal way show, like you're there to have a good time. Like, and that's that's what's cool because there's people that like our band that are just like into punk and there's people like our band that are just in the metal and there's people that are you know in all kinds of shit or whatever but uh they they know they're they're coming to our show to like blow off some steam and have a good time and uh that's the exact environment we want to create for people when i was younger my first my first apartment was um my friend jason hodges who um we were we used to tape trade like VHS tape trade and Jason Hodges is in um, he's a lot of noise bands and stuff but he's probably best known for suppression back in the day and still in the day I mean he's still fucking playing and they're awesome but um so I learned from him how um, just how to like correspond with people by like mailing letters this is like before email and shit so you, so like we were tape trading and then like living with him I saw all that fucking crazy like pen pals he had for like 10 years before and how he kept in touch with people and it was like it's like a network of friends not only just music it's it's the whole world and uh it was something i really wanted to be a part of i didn't know if i could sing or not i just fucking went for it <laughs> when i lived in richmond it was i was definitely like part of like the punk scene there like we, I used to go to like the early like Avail shows and, and uh, Richmond had a pretty cool like Richmond was cool because there's there was back then there was just killer bands in like every genre of music there was like indie rock bands the punk scene was amazing you know you had bands like Avail and Action Patrol Inquisition and they were packing up packing like you know fucking thousand cap rooms and kids were fucking all about it and everybody was supporting each other and even like the shitty bands were like having great shows and um i was in one of the shitty bands <laughs> and uh it was cool it just you know like like it just seemed the way that people support each other and, and uh 
it was there was like even um, some really cool metal bands. There's this awesome death metal band from back in the day called Disinterment. Uh, Denver is rich with bands and a really thriving music scene right now, especially in heavy music. Um, lots of bands are from there right now. Denver seems to be kind of hot right now, but I'm from there, born and raised. It wasn't always like that, so it's nice to see my city being recognized as a place that has good bands because we've always had good bands, just. Uh, people finally give shit now you know before we were just this place in the middle of the country we were begging people to stop through because we're surrounded by areas that didn't have necessarily like a, as thriving of a scene like there's nowhere within eight hours of us that is popping you know or less less than eight hours I guess I'm sorry is the best way to put it there's nowhere less than eight hours from us that's good so Denver used to be starved now everybody comes through there's a ton of bands lots of people have moved there from other places so it's uh the culture has um benefited from from the growth of the city and, and how it is now so i grew up in a really small town called towns of massachusetts and uh it's kind of interesting we have like so many uh so many musicians came from the same really small area. We have Colin Conway from Death Ray Vision. Uh, Shadows Fall is from our area. Uh, Anthony Medallia, the drummer of Atheist, is from our area. Uh, just so many. And uh, from there, you know, uh, just found the Western Mass scene, which kind of was created on the roots of... Uh, the early 2000s metalcore scene with again like your shadows fall on earth kill switch all that remains they're all from the same area that lich king is and um basically just a huge metal community in like this area of small towns came out of it and uh i would say that that is different from brooklyn because you know brooklyn is fucking huge you know <laughs> i would say like i can't even think of how much uh, culture has come out of the Brooklyn and New York City area compared to fucking towns in, in western Massachusetts, you know? It's insane. Based on the music that they're listening to, you expect them to be like these really intense, like awful people, but most metal fans I know are like, oh, hey man, how you been? They're like very soft-spoken, very sweet people. Like I know, and they're also very intelligent. Like I know this one kid, he's a he's got a doctorate in physics from MIT and uh, just like, brilliant people coming out of the metal community. It's kind of hilarious, but awesome at the same time. I love it. The smartest people I've ever met in my life have been through this community. Yeah, oh man, the most loyal people I've ever met in my life. I mean, shit man, I've been friends with the same group of guys since I was in high school, you know? And uh, it's just grown and grown from there. I, I don't lose friends often, so metal community, te definitely uh, the most loyal people I've ever known in my life. I don't know, I was nearly homeless at one point, you know? And then, uh, you know, through heavy music and stuff, I made friends, networking, and uh, about five years ago, I met the Lich King guys, and that's like pretty much brought me to where I am now. And, uh, you know, it's uh, pretty insane. I, I can't even, I can't even really put into words how much, uh, how much the metal scene has done for my life. It's, I wouldn't be the person I am today without it though. Something I've learned about the community is that it's a very tight uh, niche group. And, um, you know, you see people at shows, you see people in other bands, and there's just like this mutual bond that's just like completely unspoken. It's almost like their family or a friend or someone that you've known just for a long time and you maybe only seen them at a handful of shows, but they know who you are, they know about you, and not only that, but they care about you. If you're a band that plays anything that sounds remotely like metal, you pretty much have a built-in audience of a certain number of people who, even if they don't like it, ultimately are going to, at the very least, come and check out what you're doing. We drive from city to city on the road, meet, meet interesting people, which is, which is the cool thing because it's tough to relate sometimes with uh, a certain attitude. And if people don't understand where you're coming from, it's, it's nice to relate to somebody at least share something uh, so important with uh, somebody else such as heavy metal underground stuff well for people who don't know cleveland it's 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 midwest you know it's it's it is dead boys it's it's michigan buffalo the rust belt uh rochester it's it's about it's about 
going to work and coming home from work and being pissed off that you have to go to work and getting your aggression out through any means necessary. And uh, if that mean is holding a guitar or screaming in a microphone, then that's what it's about. We all want to be different. We don't want to be normal people. Although some of the more well-adjusted people I've met are in the metal scene, at least fan-wise, you're gonna find people that are glad to be amongst similar thinkers, and you know you fall in the pit, you get picked back up. Generally, it's a more accepting group of people, I think, than a lot of people wanna believe. That are outsiders to the scene. There's definitely, you know, rifts and, you know, I like black metal. I like brutal death slam. You know, you've got people that are, you know, they like their, their lane and they stick to their lane, and that's cool. But I, I like shows that have a couple different acts on there with different styles. But we all have a same bloodline, and that's distorted guitars, bashing drums, and somebody yelling in a microphone, and. As long as that stays alive, I think that the scene's gonna be fine. And we, this, this style of music, especially what Dying Fetus does, is not meant for everybody. There's a high entry fee, to, so to speak. Like, you don't, normal people can't process it. They hear it and they're like, what? there's a lot going on there. Or like, they're totally turned off by the vocals and they respect the musicianship. But we, do it because that way, because that's one thing that we find as, as a broad genre, not just my band, we find a, that appealing. We don't like the normal, we like the abnormal. Well, there, we definitely have a good amount of video game players, that's for sure. Uh, uh, it seems like a lot of people in the fan base were kind of, you know, just like me, you know, uh, especially the younger ones. Um, you know, kids that, you know, might not be the most popular kid in school or, you know, might have some shit going on at home or something like that. Um, it's a very, like, relatable community. Um, and uh, I think that is one of the things that draws a lot of people to it is the fact that, you know, everyone can appreciate different sounds of music, but everyone kind of is in the same group, you know what I mean? We're all here because we enjoy the same things and we're probably all similar types of people, you know? Um, but everyone definitely has everyone's back, and that's cool, too. Um, that's that's probably the big seller. Metal dudes are literally the sweetest people on the planet, dude. They're like, if it, Corpse Grinder from Cannibal Corpse literally has a video of him, like, going to Target and buying fucking plush toys, like, cute-ass toys and shit. Like, they, the people that sing about the most disgusting shit on the planet have the biggest hearts and I think that's the coolest thing. It's like a giant brotherhood on tour. We're all just trying to do something that is like weird. We're we're taking like our everyone's taking their pain. It doesn't matter what genre you are. I think every person, every musician, no matter what genre, is taking their pain or their happiness or whatever, usually pain for metal, right? They take their pain and they turn it into something fucking beautiful or something fucking awesome. And we can all fucking relate to that. It doesn't matter what you play, like we respect each other because we're doing something that's it's not easy to do and a lot of people wish they could do. It takes a lot of mental energy and a lot of time. But we do something like that that makes a positive impact and we're kind of all like this big family. It doesn't matter, country, metal, whatever. We're like, yo, we're trying to do this. We're taking our pain. We're turning it into beans, bro. It's fucking amazing. That's what it's all about, man. Writing letters, pen pals, all over the world and getting packages and music from everyone uh, that I was in touch with. Finding ads in the back of magazines that would say, write me and let's trade demos or something like that. And uh, eventually, after so many years, you start running into these people, the ones that stuck around, and uh, you feel like you know them so well because you used to write them 20 years you know and kept in touch and then the and eventually email and uh you know uh, whatsapp and you can talk to them on the phone so then all of a sudden you meet them and you're like this is fucking great and um 
Yeah, it's just been a lot of camaraderie. There's a guy that shows up and you know who he is and he shakes your hand and he lets you stay at his house. He feeds you and you're just like, this guy's awesome because I've been, I've been talking to him for 10, 15 years. We are all brothers and sisters. And even though a lot of the, uh, you know, the, the, there's a derogatory uh, 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 comments made in, in music, we are all really brothers and sisters. And th that doesn't necessarily translate to, I don't think, country, um, but uh, being able to uh, meet people from all around the world and uh, know that they, they love the same kind of music that you do and uh, that sometimes they, they, they grew up listening to the same kind of music and it means so much to them in their heart. And that's what, it, that's what it means to me, or that's what is my heart, is uh, uh, making death metal music, uh, putting it out there, making more friends. And uh, I, I can't imagine that there's a lot of other musical uh, genres that, that have that camaraderie. I mean, it's the, the, the global aspect is, is the metal community, but when you get into this niche, uh, a lot of people dismiss uh, death metal bands as fly by night or flash in a pan, whatever you want to say. But um, the, you know, I mean, Dunsauter has been here for 34 years. Uh, we're still doing it, <laughs> so. Just being very genuine to uh, just the, the passion and the, uh, the, the aggression and uh, just really trying to um, find some peace with all the fucking chaos going on in their lives, you know, coming out to a show and being able to take your aggression out on other people and uh, in a very healthy manner. I've uh, dealt with things in life. I've had a, a fairly rough road and uh, without extreme music, without the ability to, to put all my anger into that, I know for sure I'd be in jail. I'd be dead or locked up by now if uh, I didn't have an outlet uh, for all my frustration and anger and uh, just my emotions in general. What most of our fans have in common is either a conscious or subconscious desire to inhabit the animal within them. You know, I'm not trying to get too wooey or anything, but I think that metal in general, not just vitriol, but metal in general is the shape of the of nature, right? It's the it's the it's the earthly, it's the animal, it's the body to the soul and the spirit of like divinity or whatever. So I think that metal specifically speaks to the animal in people. And um, I think that, and you see it manifesting in all the different practices of metal show going, you know, the getting aggressive, moshing, um, what the subject matter of the bands really contend with. It's not about evil or destruction for destruction's sake, not saying that those things aren't tendrils of the thing, but I think the real heart of it is knowing, integrating the shadow. And I think that a lot of people, we, especially in a Judeo-Christianized society, um, we've been hammered to ignore the animal. And metal's here to reacquaint you with the animal and make yourself whole in a society and a culture that doesn't want you to be whole because they're afraid of the life-affirming qualities of your shadow, which is aggression, which doesn't necessarily need to be um, uh, vicious. You know, it doesn't need to be vicious aggression. You're not out there just trying to bully people, but it's about um, empowering yourself. And I think a lot of people that respond with to, to this kind of music and vitriol specifically because I did a lot of work to make sure that that's what our experience is speaking to. Um, there's a deep yearning to, or they already have arrived and they're just reveling in it, but there's a deep yearning to be whole again, to be, uh, to understand your nature and to understand your, the life affirming qualities of your hostility and your frustration. And, um, and to champion those things so that they are not on top of you, but you are on top of them. In metal and core or any of the extreme genres, it's it's like they're kind of like more dedicated. So they, they don't necessarily go, oh, well, there's this new there's this new artist and I'm gonna drop every other artist that I listen to and go listen to this guy. It's, it's more so like in metal. Uh, they're very dedicated and uh, stick to your guns, you know what I mean? Like, you, they kind of stick to what they like, and that's cool. And pop music, it's not really like a, a dedicated thing. They just kind of jump ship as soon as something else comes out, you know? 
what people don't know is once you've got that label, a, a big independent basically, we still call the shots. Napalm still calls the shots. We have an understanding with the label that they don't tell us what to do. If we see, think something's not right, we don't do it. That's it, and they won't force us to do it. So yeah, you know, we've got a really good label in terms of the distribution, in terms of the press, this and that. But all the internal doings, we kind of we have the final say. We would never allow anybody to dictate to us how our art goes. You know, we're very selfish in that respect. You know, so yeah, we are effectively still DIY. You know, we are. You know, so. People can make of that what they will, but that's the truth, you know. So for us, I can only speak for Napalm Death. We have to do it. I mean, you wouldn't get like the album sleeves that Napalm does or any of the layouts, just just for the benefit of people judging from a visual perspective. You wouldn't get any of that stuff if it wasn't for us having the absolute say, you know what I mean? You wouldn't, you know. So what you see, the visual art of Napalm Death comes from us. And equally on the other side, if anyone's to blame for some complete fuck-ups, it's us, nobody else, you know. So people can throw shit at us, you rather than throwing it at somebody else, you know. So. If you do things DIY, then you're in charge of what's going on. No one's dictating things that you wouldn't agree with. It's about managing shit and fucking, you know. Uh, um, keeping it where you want it in the underground. You know, I don't, we don't need to play fucking some stadium with a corporate sponsor by energy drink. Fuck off. You don't care about our music. You're just making a dime off us. And that's not why I play music. I never play music to get rich or to get laid. Those things just happened anyway. I'm just kidding. Um, no. Um, <clears throat> my secret to playing music is I've done what I've wanted to do without caring what people would think. When I went from nuclear assault to brutal truth, I didn't say, hold it, you know, I can't do this. I'm a thrash guy, I can't play grinds. I just did what I wanted. And I think that was what has uh, got me where I am today. I'm not fucking a millionaire, but I don't care. Completing things, you know, completing a tour. I mean, I still handle a lot of our merch dealings, you know, getting the stuff ordered and, and all that crap. And there's something rewarding about uh, about even, you know, doing that or or, or putting out a, a CD and, and paying attention to the, to the layout and then getting, you know, the the CD booklet back and making sure everything's where you dictated it to be. And all that stuff is just completely rewarding to me. Finished products, I guess, is what it is. Whether it's a lyric or an actual tangible good, you know, it's there's just something cool about it. I mean, being a DIY band as a DIY band, uh, it's really a double-edged sword, you know? I think growing up, especially in the late 80s when heavier metal was really kind of breaking through to the mainstream with like Metallica and Slayer, Testament, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, everybody was always like, oh, don't ever sell out. And, and I think when I was a little kid, I thought, once you signed our record label, there's gonna be a guy in a suit being like, okay guys, we need to talk about your musical direction, which has never happened. <laughs> um, so that was a totally wrong uh, <laughs> worry. Um, but to be, be a DIY band, it's, I think the main thing that, people, including myself when I was younger, don't understand is that it really is a lot of work. Um, and I'm not saying like you should feel bad for me because I have to like go after my regular day job and then spend my time packing mail or doing band business or whatever. Nobody asked me to start a fucking band. This is on me. But at the same time, you do have to sort of recognize that if you want to keep doing this and you want to be able to sustain doing this, you know, this isn't the kind of music where even if you become a signed known band. It's not like all of a sudden you're like, well, cool. I guess I'll just buy a Maserati and like fuck off, you know? Um, it's very, it's a very working class kind of ethic that defines the underground and you're gonna be doing work and a lot of it's fucking boring, you know? Like as much as I'm really happy that people order stuff from our web store and, and everything else, uh, you know, I don't, I, I don't sit there like packing envelopes, feeling like I'm so lucky to be packing this envelope. Um, you know, we we have our own screen printing shop in our studio. We print, you know, about 50% of the merchandise we take on tour. We print a lot of the merchandise that we sell in our web store. So, you know, and we own obviously not just our instruments, but like our van, our trailer, and and all these things, especially 
at, in the internet age, like you, back before the internet kind of took over everything, you could kind of act, ask your label for more money and be like, oh, we're a young band. Can you throw us some money so we can get a van, so we can get on the road, so we can build the band? And because album sales, they're just not there. You know, the streaming money is just, it's everything's sort of scaled back. So you can't just be like, hey, you just signed us. Would you like to invest $20,000 in the next three years of our career and see what happens? That's, that's not really as much of a thing anymore. And um, so it really is a lot, of, a lot of responsibility. And, you know, uh, that's why I think it's important, you know, that bands communicate with each other and talk to each other about this stuff, not just about like, hey, man, did you hear that new album? Or, hey, man, I got this cool guitar effect. Check it out. You know, bands should be talking about like, hey, how did you balance your budget? Like, how much is this agent charging versus how much is our agent charging? Because the more you know, the better job you're going to be able to do managing your own band. Um, and especially on an underground level, you know, for somebody to step in and be like, cool, I'll manage you guys, and then take 10% of your money when, you know, this is a very kind of thin margin business. Um, you know, 10% is not nothing, you know? So, uh, you know, you, you need to be wary and you need to be smart and you need to just, like I said, I think the more that bands communicate about this stuff together, about what they're doing and how it's working for them, the better it's going to be for everybody. And there are a lot more resources now than there were, you know, when I was starting to do this as a high school kid. Um, so it is really rewarding, but it's very time consuming and sometimes it's tedious and, you know, sometimes I'm like, man, isn't that guy in the suit just going to come on and be like, ah, make a record that sounds like this, boys, and straight to the top. Don't worry about anything. You know, uh, I, that, that, that's more appealing now maybe than it was when I was a kid. But, um, you know, I, it just, it, it is a lot of fucking work. And it, it's something where it's one thing to love the music. And there's a lot of people that love the music. And then they realize what touring really is and they realize what the business really is and they look at the numbers and they're like, fuck this. Like, you know, I've known tons of great guitar players and just great musicians in general who are like, yeah, this is a dumb business to be in. And it's like, well, objectively you are correct. This is a dumb business to be in. But, uh, you know, I'm very happy to, to still be doing it. I don't want to talk anybody out of it. I'm just trying to be fucking frank, you know? Doing things like yourself, that, you know, traditional DIY, like ethic, um, it's got a lot of it's 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 got a lot of rewarding, you know, properties to it. I think the number one thing is is like just teaching you that you can do it yourself. Like just picking something up and trying to do it yourself versus like paying somebody to do it or you know um, asking someone else to do it. Um, it I, I think it just it it shows you what you're capable of. Um, you know and. And that's why I value punk and hardcore so much, you know, because there's a lot to it that taught me that personally. You know, and I know there's a lot of people that just have been in metal and they've just been in metal always. And they got that same DIY ethic installed into them. I just got it from somewhere else, you know. When I started going to shows, like I started, I found out about punk and hardcore shows and, you know, they were all like in the attic of a building or like, you know, outside or just in less, like these little tiny places, you know, where it was just like a generator and stuff. And or a small tiny club where the electricity hardly even worked or something, you know? And so seeing that like, hey, if you want to do this, you can do it yourself. You just got to find the means and you got to make it happen, you know? Um, that was super important, you know? Um, and I think that has rewarded me the most nowadays because I know like, you know, like my band's logo, you know? I got tired of trying to pay people to do it and not being happy with it, so I drew it myself. I didn't know what I was doing. The most rewarding part of doing things DIY is like being a face-to-face -face with the people that are making the shows happen or whatever it is, you know, like we've had uh, shows with the promoters several times. We know each other, you know, like when we show up, he knows our names. If we weren't doing all our own stuff or, you know, being face to face with the people that uh, we work with in it, there's, it feels weird, you know. Um, we, we are, we do have people that handle different things for us now, but I still try to uh, maintain a relationship with, with the different people. And it's all, you know, like, I feel like if you're removed far from too much, whether it's working with a, 
label or working with show promoters or booking agents or whatever, um, you don't feel as involved, you know, and then I think that that trickles down into you don't feel connected to the people that are coming to see you, you know, like it, it, it might be, sometimes I might want to just like hide backstage when we play, you know, um, I might be tired or whatever, but, um, we try to make an effort to go out and like meet people, and, you know, appreciate the people that are coming to see us and, you know, like that are paying to see us buying our records or whatever, you know, it's, it's not always easy, but, um, I feel like when you're doing things DIY, you're in much closer proximity to, you know, the source or the people that are supporting you. I really like to be in control of what we do. Um, so as the other people in the band, um, like just earlier today, I looked at the, the tour van that we were in and I, we were loading out and I realized like we did this ourselves. Like we're just a bunch of weirdos. Like I didn't, you know, like I, I took, it was really hard for me to get through school and all that stuff. And like, you know, I, I'm not the smartest person, but I was able to work really hard at death metal and we're seeing the benefits of that work. Um, and, uh, like that that is DIY like we, we did it ourselves like we're on a big label now and we have all that but even even with that we sh- we're still in control we're still doing stuff ourselves we drive ourselves to the shows we set the merch up we sell the merch we choose the designs we choose the artists for the merch you know like a- a- we're, we're in control of everything and um, and and then like talking about shows specifically like um you know we have our friends like on this tour chase selected all all the bands that or most of the bands that open for us for our headlining shows um you know and then chase scoured through like band camp and stuff looking for bands in the cities to <laughs> to open you know and um and so, so just having that control i think preserves your creative intent and so, so what, whatever your goal is with your music and your project or your art, being, being able to have a DIY approach allows you to preserve like that, that um, whatever you are going for. The most rewarding thing that I see when doing things DIY is everything that you put into something, it's coming from you and you, it's nothing but reward from that point. So you fronted the bill to get your CD and everything pressed. You have your jewel case or your digi pack. You've printed your own merch. Money that you put in, you're seeing that go to somebody who's gonna listen to you, who's gonna follow you, and it's gonna be a fan. And um, that's always sick, is like the people that are fans of the DIY bands, they're diehards, you know? Even when, instead of playing some like small dive bar or a basement, and you're out there playing like a concert hall or a really big venue, those people will watch you along that journey and they'll be at every show and that's what's sick about it. When you do things yourself, the success and the failures are all yours. You don't have anybody to blame. You don't have anybody else to give an attaboy to. There's no patting on the back. You pat yourself on the back. The reward feels that much greater and the failure feels that much worse. But you're beholden to no one. It's you, your guys, you did it yourself. The gains feel great, the losses feel bad, but you did it by yourself, you can feel pride in that, um, and uh, you learn the most from failures. So if you tried a tour one time and you, you didn't uh, you didn't know that there weren't going to be gas stations along the way, like you're in Canada and if you're in Canada and you're going over the Great Lakes, stop at every gas station and fuel up because there are some stretches, hundreds of mile stretches where you don't want to get caught on the side of the road. Didn't happen to me. But those are like things, you know, DIY, these are lessons you learn and when <laughs> when the road hits you, it hits you hard, but when you get a win, you feel good. We got a couple crew with us. We got a, you know, merch person, a uh, sound man, and we got a drum tech um, and a light dude, but 
Other than that, I mean, well, we have an agent that books our shows, of course, but we have no management. I mean, we take care of everything on our own. I mean, book it, you know, the merch, we take care of it ourselves, getting somebody to take, you know, print it for us, uh, uh, calling up bus companies to rent the bus, you know what I mean? We do our own websites, we do our own Facebook stuff, I mean, everything. We are still a DIY band, and um, I take it upon myself to do managerial stuff that's not fun, some paperwork stuff, but I trust myself, my band trusts me, we split everything evenly, and I think that's the way to go. I think a lot of management will break up a band. They'll pit people against each other. So we trust each other. We come from a more punk ethic where a lot of metal bands don't. Like we came up playing in basements and house shows. We've all booked shows ourselves, or at least me and Tony have. And uh, we know back to front what it should come from. And it's just like you get on this high horse thinking you're, you know, <laughs> you're in it for money or you're in it for something else and it's, you're going to fail. You know, you gotta be doing it for the right reasons. I load my own shit every day. Put my shit on stage. Uh, just change my own guitar strings today. I don't mind it at all. You know why? I don't wanna pay. I, you know why? I have the ability to do it, thank God. So I don't need to pay somebody else to do it for me. I mean, if I was 10 years older, maybe it's like I can't carry the cabinets anymore. Well, I hope, hope not. I hope I still can. But it doesn't bother me one bit because I'm, a, I'm able to do it. You know, I always think to myself, and this might, might sound cheesy or goofy or whatever, I always think to myself, like, God, this sucks carrying this guy, you know, but what about the poor guy who would give anything to get up out of a wheelchair or something and be able to carry a fucking cabinet upstairs? So you just got to do it. I love doing, doing the do-it-yourself thing. I mean, we're able to make a living by doing it ourselves with Crowbar, you know, um, and... You know, with Down, I mean, it's a much bigger band and, and we make a lot more money, so we're able to have, uh, you know, guitar techs and things like that. But I think most of the bands, really, when you when you play it smart, if you keep it really limited, you know, um, to what your crew or whatever might be, you know, and you just do it yourself, you make a hell of a lot more money. And, uh, and you know, I, I mean, I, this is what I've been doing since I'm 15 years old, so, you know. <laughs> And that was 41 years ago. I don't know how to do stuff DIY, like like fix your toilet and and do stuff like that. Now I have no idea how to do that stuff. You know, that's that's not me. Um, but but doing uh, DIY music, man. I mean, it's it is important. You know, you, you should you should be able to. You you want to you want to concentrate on the music, but uh, you want to know what's going on. So, and and it's all about. That's what I say, man. Just stay street. You didn't really have anyone to do everything for you or you know you didn't pretty much take the easy way out you know you did it all by yourself and that's also another thing that kind of makes it more of like a grateful experience for you you know because we've been we've all been in bands like for a long time that have either failed or no one cared about them or whatever or people did care about them but we didn't get the the type of love that we maybe deserved you know so i think the diy thing you know if it ever does work out if you're in a band it's gonna make you appreciate it a little more, not take advantage of it, so, for sure. Well, I mean, we work with labels and stuff, you know? We, we used to, we've gotten screwed over by labels, too, as well. But um, now we license our stuff to a, a bigger label. But we mostly do, you know, do the shirts, we just have a friend print them. You know, we make our own flyers and stuff sometimes for, for social media. And it used to be actual flyers, you know? You have to steal one of those counters from Kinko's and just go and use it all the time. Um, I guess that's all, you know, part of it. It just feels good to do stuff yourself. Everything about doing doing things DIY while touring is so rewarding. It's, it's you need you need to get your hands dirty. You need to get dirty. You need to you need to break down. You need to play yeah. shitty venues. <laughs> Yeah. You need to play to nobody. <laughs> you need to make no money in merch. You know, you need to be humbled to, to do this type of music. And, like, no band that's, like, uh, you know, that's, like, made it or whatever hasn't played, like, some busted-ass shows. You know, it's, like, yeah. everybody, you know. Humility is, is the greatest thing for DIY yeah. bands. You, you need to have some humility in this. You know, yeah. it's... It's, it's necessary, I feel like. I mean, also, if, like, everything was going perfect all the time, it wouldn't really be that much, I mean, much of an adventure, I guess. Yeah. And, like, not to sound cheesy, yeah. but, like, that's kind of what I do, like, about doing, like, DIY stuff or, you know, touring is, like, it does feel like an adventure, like, you know. 
like going out with your friends and like doing what you enjoy doing. So it's yeah, you get something different out of it every time. Yeah, you know, so every you, every tour you get you get some yeah. some more knowledge, you know, some more some more stuff you can use for later later in the future for tours, you know. Yeah, and like it going helps. through like the shitty parts of touring with your friends makes is what makes it kind of an adventure. Like if it was just happy times all the time, it would be like a vacation. It wouldn't be like you're working for anything, but all the obstacles on the way make it like you're working towards something, you know. So all I can say is that I'm happy where we're at now, you know. The way we've been doing it, I mean, we do have we do have support from our label and stuff, but it's pretty much still is DIY because we're still doing everything ourselves, we're managing ourselves, or you know, all the touring stuff. I mean, we have an agent, but the majority of the stuff, like we, you know, when we're on tour, we do it ourselves. We don't have a tour manager or anything, you know. So it's still considered DIY. But um, don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that it wouldn't be great to have the luxury of it all. I mean. If we ever get to that point, that'd be great. But if not, you know, we just, like I said, I don't think we'd, I'd stop doing music um, for that reason. You know, I, I, I'd still be doing music even if I stay in the same place I am now for the rest of my life. Um, it's not because, I mean, I, I would keep doing it because I enjoy it, you know? This is what I love to do. And um, if we ever get to that point, then that would be great. But if not, you know, like I said, it's no biggie. Um, but, yeah, I think there's a lot of benefits to doing a DIY because, you know, how everything is happening, where everything's going, and how, how you know, you also learn a lot, too. You know, like, um, before touring, like, I didn't know anything about this, like, the whole touring stuff and how to, like, because all the managing, I pretty much do it myself. I mean, I have someone that helps me that I reach out to when I have questions that I don't know, like, what to do. Um, or for advice, you know, I have somebody that I talk to for that, but, you know, as far as, like, managing the band, like, I do it all myself, so it's a lot, it's definitely a lot that I have learned, and there's definitely a lot that I still have to learn, but um, that's the thing that I really like about DIY, because, you know, you actually get out there and put yourself in that position to, you know, to do it yourself, you know, pretty much, but, but yeah, um, yeah, I don't know, I, I mean, like anything else, there's goods and bads to it, you know, but I can't complain, I'm happy where we are, and, you know, We'll just, we'll keep going no matter what, you know? That's the plan, at least. <laughs> the harder you work, the more rewarding it is. Um, if, uh, if I was to put it all up to someone else, uh, I don't think you appreciate it enough when something is handed to you. So you just gotta go out there and just work for it. And doing things DIY, uh, everything from, especially when we were young, photocopy and demo uh, tapes and dubbing them yourself and uh, printing, Silk screening shirts in your garage, um, sending out flyers that people don't give a shit about. It didn't matter. You just kept kept moving forward, kept putting it out, and that's what's most rewarding about being uh, doing things DIY. And like this show, this is put on not by a professional promoter. It's put on by a, a, a friend and a fan, and he did an excellent job, and he always does an excellent job in finding those people that. You know, if you work with good people, good things will happen. And that's what's great about doing it DIY. I, I'll be very candid and honest. Um, it's given me confidence, you know, to be real with you. It's, it's, it's given me confidence that I don't know. I've thought about this before. You know, I don't know that I would have that otherwise. Just doing, you know, whatever. I think back to what life was like before anyone gave a shit about us. And, you know, I'm definitely more confident now. Not some, not egotistical or anything, just, I was too hyperactive. I was way too hyperactive to just be behind the kit. And I had too much to say, I guess, you know? Um, so, you know, again, back to the confidence thing is doing that really helped boost my confidence, I guess, you know. Um, I'm, maybe I'm just... Ah, shit, I don't know. Sometimes I wonder, am I more um, self-conscious uh, now or, or back when I was a teen, you know? And, I don't know, sometimes I still think I'm the same fucking person I was when I was a teenager. I definitely dress the same. <laughs> so, that just comes with the this music lifestyle thing, you know, black t-shirts and fucking jeans or whatever. I mean, it's, it's how it's going to be. 
so not really much has changed I'm just it's been 30 years <laughs> since I was really starting to get you know get into metal and death metal and all that shit so I've been doing these vocals for since I was 16 so 31 years now um but I was a drummer I was hyperactive and I had, I had too much to say you know being involved with the, this scene or community or movement or whatever the fuck you want to call it I mean it really has defined so many aspects of my life you know um uh, I have met so many of my, you know, the overwhelming majority of my close friends through playing this music, you know, my wife, lots of ex-girlfriends, <laughs> um, you know, I, I wouldn't have met so many of these people without playing music and um, it's afforded me, you know, I've been very fortunate in that, you know, the band has achieved whatever level of success that we have, you know. I've gotten to do a lot of things a lot of people haven't done, you know. I've been to Japan, I've been to Iceland, I've been to South America, I've been to wherever, you know. Um, so it's kind of enabled me to learn more about the world in general and, you know, also just connect with cool people everywhere I go, you know. Everywhere we go, you know, it seems like we meet people that, uh, uh, make me feel like, oh, this is a this. I made the right choice, like continuing to do this because I'm, I'm glad to be here. These people are glad I'm here. I'm glad they're here. Like we're having a good time, and um, you know, one of the greatest things about it, again, as somebody in their 40s now, like a lot of people that I knew from back in the day and in high school and stuff, their lives are very different than mine. And I think one of the things that's really tough as as an adult. Uh, is to, you know, maintain friendships because you got a career, you got a house, you got a kid, you got a dog, blah, 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 you know, you got a sick uncle or whatever the fuck. And it's not that, you know, we don't have some of those things going on in our lives, but we're sort of forced to carve out this time where it's like, okay, it's just me and five of my friends and we're going to be in a van for four weeks and we get to hang out every day. We get to go to the bar if we want to every night. And these are just opportunities to really like maintain those friendships and those connections and you know I have friends all over the place you know it's like Baltimore Philly New York like it was like a fucking reunion every night like oh my god how you been especially after the pandemic so those personal connections end up being kind of just as important as the enjoyment of the music and sort of the belief in what we're doing with our music, you know, so it's, it's been super enriching, you know. It's crazy to say that death metal has made a positive impact on life. It's helped me, you know, work towards getting in shape. Um, it's helped me realize that, like, if I don't get up and move um, and I don't get up and work towards something, that before I know it, my life's just going to be meaningless, you know? It sort of was a gateway into me realizing that, like, you know, I control, like, the choices that I make and that I can, I and my friends can do what we want to do. You know, no matter what anybody tells us, you know, and, you know, there's lots of people, you know, that have that same story, you know, with the different things that they like. Death metal just happens to be the story for me, you know, um, it happens to be that gateway into, uh, you know, a more conscious living, you know, and and like and just realizing like, man, we're not here for very long, you know, so I'm going to rip it up. And I'm going to fucking, you know, uh, I'll, I'll tear down, you know, the walls that, you know, I built up in my own head and I'll rebuild them if I have to. I got time, you know, um, and, you know, each day, you know, I can I can get up and I can to push, you know, and that's that's what death metal. That's what death metal has done, you know, for my life. I can call my bandmates, uh, my family, you know, because I would have never met them if it wasn't for this style of music. Um, I mean, I've known Chad for quite a while now. Uh, before we even knew each other, our bands actually used to play shows together and things like that. Same with uh, Chris and, and Matt, like all of our bands have like played together in the past, you know? So if it wasn't for this, we wouldn't know each other. Uh, we wouldn't know like m pretty much <laughs> all of our friends, it seems like, you know, and also getting to like meet all these new people and hear, the, hear their stories about how this style of music impacts their life positively, you know, especially ours. It's very, uh, 
It's very nice to hear that. We use this style of music as an outlet for our negative emotions, you know? Uh, it, like writing about, like, you know, lyrics about like depression and uh, just general feelings of like hopelessness and things like that. On a personal level, I mean, it's, it's, it's given me, <laughs> is, is goofy as it sounds, but it's, it's, it is my existence. I mean, since, since that age of 10, I didn't, I didn't do anything else. I had no fucking stamp collection. I, had, I, I didn't, I didn't want to do, I didn't care about like going to college. I didn't care about any of that stuff. It, the only thing that mattered is, is playing music, listening to music, uh, hearing live music. Um, so without that, what have you got? I'm, I'm sleeping in a fucking ditch somewhere, you know? So, um, or going to work and just being, um, being distracted by uh, football on TV or, or whatever movie or whatever, whatever people are trying to push on you to distract you from something that's real. I really don't. I have <laughs> no other cares in life besides maybe eating food or drinking water to get me to exist another day so I can listen to some more tunes. I started the band at a very important time in my life. I had just got sober, so it was like um, a transitional time, and it gave me, um, you know, something to do, something to stay busy, and it also, now as things have progressed, it's given me something to um, work on every day. It gives me something to, like, um, in the back of my head, I know that I've, I've built all this up, uh, and, you know, I have to stay on this on the path that I'm on, or it's it's all gonna go away. You know, it's all be flushed down the toilet. So it like gives me something to live for. I need to play shows. I I, I need to release that energy. Um, I get depressed if I'm not playing. So just for my physical well-being, like just being able to play, really helps me. It's a really good release. Um, being on stage is my favorite thing. Like, I, I love it. I love when you look out and people in the crowd are just having a blast. And they're just, like, letting loose and just enjoying themselves and getting wild and, like, you know, doing whatever the hell they want to do, you know. And that, that like, that is such great therapy for me, just to be able to, like, just go up and play. I also really enjoy writing. Um... And, and that is a lifelong thing for me as I just continually want to get better at writing music, writing riffs and um, writing song structure and working on that. And that is an art to me. And it's, uh, yeah, just, it, it's just a big part of my life. And it's, just, it's therapy, I would say. Death metal in a whole for me is therapy. It's also a community. It's my friends. It's my family. You know, so it's, 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 it's everything to me, you know? I, I, <laughs> I don't know what I would be without it. Oh, well, I mean, you know, I tour the fucking world with my best friends. We were fucking crying last night. I was fucking with my, uh, our, like, old merch girl who's one of my fucking best friends. She's like my sister. We are just crying because, you know, we missed each other. And, uh, I mean, you just get these, this bond with, with people all over the years. And the, and the longer it goes, the more it grows. And just... I don't know. It's it's uh it's it's very important to me and, and um yeah, it's, it's something that I'm fucking really stoked to be a part of and and try my best to not take it for granted cuz you never know when you're going to fucking lose it cuz that shit that can happen. Before I was in a band, I was uh I played baseball. And I skateboarded, and that was like my life. Basically, once I started skateboarding, I stopped playing baseball. And then skateboarding was like, that was what I wanted to do. And then my first show ever was at a skate park, and my brother was like, learn how to play drums. And then that was ninth grade. So ever since ninth grade, there hasn't been anything else besides play music. I've literally made a living playing music since high school, so. Uh, I was just working regular jobs, just doing regular like at home life stuff before music really um i've been in and out of bands so in between those periods is what i'm referring to i've been playing in bands for the past like 10 to 12 years um in and out but um right now my main priority is just this is this 100 percent this uh just take it as far as it will possibly go really this is it's all that I see. Once you've sacrificed so much, that you don't have any other choice. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm 
I'm 33. It's going to be really hard to build another career. Not that I would want to, but you know what I mean? I've sacrificed every single dime of my life to being able to play music on tour. To, you know, and, and we don't make a lot of money, but if you want to do something, you fucking figure it out. Yep. I definitely feel like I'm in the right place where I'm supposed to be. Um, not that I wasn't in, you know, beforehand, before I started doing music, um, but you know, I can't, I can't imagine what my life would be like if I wasn't doing music, you know? I think it would be a very strange, strange place for me. Um, so like I said, music is like my, my outlet to, you know, to get away from all the bullshit. Playing music as a career and for a living or whatever, like, it's, it's very therapeutic for me. I mean, I was telling my daughter on the phone today, she's 18 years old and she's like, you know, she's, since she was born, I've been touring, you know, so um, I was telling her, I'm like, well, we only played 45 minutes, so really for 23 hours and 15 minutes in a day, I'm just waiting for that 50, 45 minutes that I live for, you know, but I, I remember seeing an interview with Lemmy years ago, and he's talking about management and record labels and booking agencies and all this, everybody just robs you blind. And he's like, they can take all my fucking money, they can take everything they want away. You know what they can't take away? That one hour a night on stage. I get that, and that's that. So for me, it's just, it's therapy for me. You see the, the crowd singing the songs, you know, uh, when you play countries in Eastern Europe and Russia and all, grown men are crying. This is a positive thing. This is not, you know, everybody, oh God, Satan, you know, heavy metal. Bullshit. Motherfuckers are loving this. You know, it's good for your heart. It's good for your mind. It's good. It's good for your spirit. For me, it's like letting my personal aggression out, you know, on stage. Like you could not want to be on tour. Like we tour a lot, you know, you don't want to get up there every night. But for me, like once I get up there and I sweat it out, I'm wide awake and I feed off the energy of, of the crowd and it makes me realize why I'm doing it in the first place. Because from a distance, sometimes you're just over it. But the minute you get out there and then like energy is a real thing, you can feed off that. And imagine like 500 kids just waiting, like hungry, like angst, you know, I'm big on angst, you know, and if we could exude that and like have people throw it back at you, I get chills right now just even talking about it, you know. And like, I'm like tired all day, I'm over it. And then I get there and I'm like, right now I'm wide awake because I just played a show, you know? And that's like endorphins, like a real drug. You don't gotta get fucked up for that. Like that's the real thing, you know, energy's real. It gave me something to do but as a kid, really. You know, there wasn't much, you know, growing up in New Hampshire uh, for like constructive focus. Uh, so absolutely it taking me out of all the bad shit other people were into. Um, and like putting me in my bedroom and getting me practicing guitar, uh, I think probably is the most significant like impact on me. Like it kind of gave me creative, um, you know, an emotional outlet as a kid. But it was definitely, you know, carried throughout, you know, my life. Uh, and the opportunity to travel, I think, you know, I never would have been able to go to the place I've gone, you know, if I, if I wasn't playing music, you know, and playing in this band. I remember getting uh, and screaming matches with my parents because they're like, you got to do homework. And I'm like, I'm doing the important thing right now. I'm talking about playing, <laughs> like playing guitar. I'm doing the important thing right now. And they're like, that's, that's cool, but like, you got to do your homework. Cause that's, that's going to like, that's going to be your job someday. I was like, nah, I'm going to play guitar. That's going to be my job. Do what you think is the right thing to do and go for it. You know, it might stick, it might not. You gotta be prepared that it might not. You know, it's just the way things go. Um, but yeah, follow follow the courage of your convictions, to use a horrible cliche, you know, but it's like, that's just it, you know. Um, people often ask, oh, can you give me some industry advice? Not really, you know, because that's not the, what, that's not the angle I come in from, you know. What I, the angle I come in from is, to me, more, way more organic than that, you know. So it's just, you know, do what you think is right. Always be willing to listen to other people. But if you really, if you really can't get anything from what other people have told you, if you still think, if they contradict what you're doing, but you still think you're in the right, then go for it. You can only be right or wrong for yourself. I'll just shave it down to 10 of them. No, um, <clears throat> Don't do overnight drives if you don't plan to sleep. Um, 
It's just more about making sure you're coherent. There's been nightmare fucking things on tour where plane flights get canceled. That's out of your hands. You can't fucking... You want to get where you're going on time so you can play a show. I played a show in Slovenia once where... Brutal truth, we were, I was trying to fly out of Rochester on a Friday or a Thursday for a show on Saturday. The flight got canceled. I had to go back and fly out Friday night. Now I'm on the plane Friday and there's a fucking screaming baby on the flight so I can't sleep. So those things are out of your hands. Do what you can to mitigate bullshit. But when you get that adrenaline rush, nothing else matters. So you, when it's time to fucking make the donuts, you make the fucking donuts. But, um... Do everything you can to be well rested, which to 20 year olds they're gonna go, oh, I'm a pussy, you're, you know, I'm a pussy for saying that, but um, <clears throat> you have a job. Believe it or not, playing metal is a job. People pay money to see you. Have your shit together and give them the most brutal show you can, which means do everything you can to fucking make that happen. I can't be any more specific than that because there's too many variables. Some of which are out of your control. I just remember it was 93 because it was like Cannibal Corpse. I went to go see them and they had just gotten the, the covers for Tomb of the Mutilated. They were still doing, they were still touring for Butchered at Birth. So I was there, I was standing there when they got like a box of just the covers for the CDs in and they were like, hey, check this out. And Alex Webster hung out with me like all night. We just sat there and shot the shit for like two hours, yeah. And I just always remembered, you know, if I ever am in his spot or whatever or in that position where I'm going and playing and touring and people are coming to see my band I'm just I gotta remember to you gotta always be like that like that's the way to be everybody knows <laughs> if you know Cannibal Corpse you, and you've paid any attention to them you know Alex Webster's like a genuine sweet guy he's just a good guy and I kind of always wanted to just, you know be more like that I'm happy that it's kind of uh, come back to I consider it kind of more meat and potatoes of, of the style because I, I believe that the only limit anybody has, um, you know, coming up with stuff or writing music is their own imagination and their own mind. A lot of people, you know, to say, oh, everything's already been done and, um, you know, all that bullshit. But, you know, listen to, uh, I mean, listen to a band like Immolation, you know, they're, you know, every time they put on an album, it's like they're coming up with these new ideas. So obviously, those guys have a lot of, a lot to express and a lot of originality in what they do. It's and you would think that uh, a band like that, it's been playing for so long, wouldn't. But they, you know, they still always go above and beyond. And and you know, I think bands that act like they they have to change or add stuff to the music to make it different either don't have a good imagination or maybe they just you know they maybe just want to do something else you know and they're using that as an excuse because i i never had a problem like i never had a dry spell where i'm just like you know i don't know what to write i just i get on a guitar, go to practice, and the songs just fall out a lot of times, you know, because it's just, just part of who you are as a person and not, it's not, um, you know, I don't have to think about it and be like, oh, okay, I got to write a song, let's think of, you know, it's like, no, you just, I mean, you might think about what kind of song you want to write, but you're not really, it's not that much thought put into it, it's more just happens, but maybe it's uh, after doing it for a while, you, maybe you, if once you learn how to channel your own brain into just thinking in music, it's a lot easier, you know, because even when I was younger, it was a lot harder for me, I think, to write songs, because I, I didn't even know what I wrote, if it could be a song or not, and now it's like I know, okay, this, you know, I know how to do it all, it just makes sense, it's just, I guess it's just experience or something like that. I could just relate to when I started, I didn't know, I didn't know and the difference between a bass or a guitar you know, or a banjo for that extent. I just knew that I like I originally wanted to play bass, not because I knew what a bass sounded like, because like Gene Simmons played a bass, uh, Steve Harris played a bass, you know, and they were cool, you know, and I was like, I want to play bass, I, you know, and then I only switched to guitar because I couldn't find a bass teacher. I didn't I didn't know a difference, so I just bought a guitar and I figured, okay, well, I'll learn an instrument that someone could teach me. Um, and it just happened to kind of go from there. Um, 
Um, as far as giving someone advice, I mean, it's difficult because, you know, certain people are just have a talent to do something like, you know, getting into woodwork or anything, you know, you have to have a talent to do it. And with an instrument, you have to just have a talent to do it. I mean, the best thing I guess do is just try to say, pick up, you know, a guitar, try to get some lessons, kind of learn what you're, you're doing. I would say, you know, as far as if you like decide to play a certain instrument, probably the biggest problem in music today that it's best to probably try to avoid is to depend on all the YouTube tutorials on how to play everything because everybody is learning how to play everything the same exact way and that is terrible for music. There's, there's, the, there's no rules in creating music. People might tell you there's rules you know, yeah, you can learn your scales and you could learn your chords and stuff like that. But in reality, there's no rules. If there's rules in metal, especially, or especially if it's death metal or grindcore or something, if you have rules for that, then you're doing it wrong. You know, it's just the bottom line. Um, so, like, to put it in perspective for myself, I, I learned from... Uh, just a, a regular guitar teacher who was, he, he played in like a kind of a, a kind of a poserish type band. He, they would play like Scorpions and uh, Death Leopard songs, and he taught me a couple songs and the basics of guitar. Then I took lessons from a guy Ed Furman, who was the guitar player for the band Hades, and um, he taught me a little bit about it. Then I then I, when I went to college, I took just I just took a guitar class in college from a, um, it was supposed to be a classical, um, you're learning how to you play classical and read sheet music, but it ended up being like this old jazz dude, and he just kind of taught me how to read sheet music, but then kind of, you know, showed me in a jazz way to do it, but I just learned, like, from those kind of sources, and I would maybe, I, I remember buying, like, a guitar book for like Iron Maiden or something and um, Black Sabbath and I learned the songs that I could from there you know but when you learn this stuff on your own like you don't know you don't understand early on like the pickings and you know all these things that like I learned later on that were like important for most death metal bands but I didn't give a fuck about it in myself you know but it was a it was just um it's better it's better to go off the beaten path learning i guess i mean another another example of um myself is that i didn't even care to know about the drums and the guitar um uh, locking into each other as far as like having you know pick notes to each drum to each bass drum or whatever you know like when you're doing a double bass you're supposed to go do 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 you know which i mean i did it because it sounded right but i didn't really know that it was like a thing it was just like okay i'm playing this riff he's playing the drums i just picked the guitar this way and it makes sense or whatever but i started learning in the late 90s with uh, touring with some other bands that there became like rules to like this stuff and i was like it just seems wrong you know because i besides being into metal i grew up with a lot of punk and stuff i grew up with the dead kennedys and uh black flag and mdc all these bands like that like agnostic front and they didn't give a fuck about like how many notes you're playing in the riff or whatever you're just, you're just picking as fast as you can and going for it i mean that's how our uh you know early stuff like onward go gotha and mortal throne we just fucking went for it you know it wasn't like oh shit you know like, as long as we, it was kind of tight and we knew okay we're starting on the one we're starting on the one and just whatever happens in between happens and it sounds fucking good and you know if someone wants to tell me it's wrong okay fuck tell me it's wrong i don't give a fuck you know but the music is the music and you know i i think the albums came out good without knowing what the hell i was doing and other people seem to like it 
So it's like, you know, as long as the people that like it, like it, and the people I like it, you know, and the people in the band enjoy it, that's all. It's important. So getting back to um, the original question, um, try to follow your own path. Don't, don't, I, I watch these, some of these YouTube things. They're talented players and stuff like that, you know, and it's good. It's it's good to know that stuff. But I mean, if you and like what sixty thousand other guitar players are watching the same guy do the same exact thing, and you work on your technique that the same exact way, you're going to be the same as maybe thirty thousand of those sixty thousand guitars. Because other guitars probably can't do it, but there's some that will, which is nice. But at the same time, it's boring unless you just want to be just like everybody else and just you know play everything in your perfect little box and um whatever and i mean you know maybe that's good for you you know but for death metal uh, it's it's how it's how the music sounds not um you know i guess my mantra has been from day one it's not the riff itself it's not the notes in the riff it's the feeling you get when you hear the riff. That's what's important. Being that I've been around for so long, we go out of our way to try to help out the newer, younger bands with stuff. Like when Crowbar would headline and we'd have younger bands under us, uh, Rob and my wife, who's a tour manager, she would always make sure to take care of them, make sure they get some kind of buyout, make sure if they want beer, they get it. They at least need a case of water. They need, you know, they need something. So we always try to accommodate with things like like room on stage, if you need to share a cabinet or whatnot, you know, we always try to accommodate and help people out. So because people did that for us on our way up, and that's just the way it's supposed to be. If this style of music is something that you want to get into and you want to perform and you want to record, just do it. Don't put any thought into it. Just put all your heart into it. And uh, you know, I mean, before. I started doing like pretty cool tours and everything. I've went through vehicles, jobs, girlfriends, all kinds of shit, just to try to make something happen with music. And uh, I think that's what it takes. You just gotta go balls to the wall and give it everything you got if it's something that you really want. <laughs> well, with no talent, I guess. I mean, you can still do a band. That's what punk rock was all about in the beginning. And I guess it still is too. There's still bands coming out that only know three chords. You know, you don't even have to know three chords. You can know like one chord and start a band of some type, you know? Um, advice, I don't, you just gotta stick with it. Even at times when you people hate you and think that, you know, they, or you think you should break up or something because people are just fucking hating you, which has happened to us many times. But uh, um, you just gotta stick to it, man. Whatever you do, you have to believe in uh, the whole thing. You know, and be willing to put in some work and get on the road and sleep on people's floors and eat trash food and stuff, you know. We try to get smarter every time we tour. We try, you know, but we'll, we still end up screwing up somehow. But I mean, we'd get a hotel room and have five people in one room. We have to sneak them in the back of the hotel, you know, because we couldn't afford anything else. And that was a luxury. Trust your gut, man. Be who you are. And if, and if, not this type of music and, and, and uh, this type of lifestyle isn't for everybody. As a matter of fact, it's for the smallest percentage of the world, you know? So um, we're, we're all in the same low gutter level, look down upon part of, of society. So would I, would I encourage that amongst people? If that's what your gut tells you to do, fuck yeah, do it. <laughs> I remember when uh, I was in high school, uh, putting out the first Nunslaughter demo, everybody said, that sounds like shit. And, and we were like, I don't care. And we just dubbed hundreds of them and gave them away and sold them. I think it was three bucks a piece we were selling these cassettes for. Um, and uh, uh, gotta just keep pushing forward. I, I, uh, I think it was actually Dave Grohl that said, uh, it doesn't matter, just, just pound it out and keep making, it might be the shittiest music anyone has ever made but the next one will be a slightly better and the next one after that will be better just keep going forward originally i was the original bass player in nunslaughter and i was happy to let somebody else sing and be the front of the band and whenever he uh greg ended up deciding he didn't want to do it anymore we were left with a, 
uh, no vocalist, and I just said, I, I got to do it. And that was something I really had a difficulty overcoming, being the front of the, the band, the voice of the band, writing people, telling them that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the new correspondent that they're going to have to deal with. And um, that, was, that was difficult. And in, in fronting, the, fronting the band is... is it's a lot, of, a lot of shit you gotta put up with, <laughs> and uh, yeah. And so if you're if you're uh, if you're shy, it's a good way to get out of that. Don't let people hold you back. You know, like if you want to do play guitar or play drums or whatever, and don't let people beat you down. Just move forward, take a step forward, and keep going. You know, and um, don't let people influence you the wrong way. Go for it, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Whatever you love, do it. <laughs> We're still a band because we get along, and you know we can put like petty differences aside. Like every band's gotta get in fights and like crumble, you know. And there's people that like continue on just because that's their living or their income or something. But we all love each other, you know. We're all friends. We've we've stuck together, and I mean, you, you know, you pick your battles with that stuff. Of course, you're going to not get along from time to time, but once you get out there and you see that you're, like, basically started a movement, it's hard to get away from it, you know? If you want a tour, you got to take yourself seriously, which is not to say you don't, you can't have fun, because obviously it's a fun thing to play music, but um, there's that, and then also you got to be able to make sacrifices to work, you know what I mean? Like, you got to you got to be able to go, okay, well, I'm leaving my family for a month and a half to go play shows and be cool with that. And you got to be cool with being able to be fucking constantly like, okay, well, I slept for four hours and then maybe I'll have time to do laundry and then we got to go to the show. So it's like you got to definitely be able to uh, make the sacrifices needed to succeed and tour and stuff like that. But ultimately, like... I don't know, I'd say stay true to yourself and like play what you want to play and take yourself seriously and invest money into what you're doing and you'll you'll get there. For somebody that, that wants to get started in the scene now, um, I think you know, you're very fortunate in the internet age because there's a lot more resources around about sort of what it takes to be in a band. There's a lot more knowledge about how the industry works. Um, there's a lot more knowledge as far as like just instrumental tutorials and stuff. You know, you could be on YouTube and, you know, you could spend a year on YouTube, either come out like a killer guitar player or like a crazy, like, flat earth person. But uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully it's the former, you know. Um, I, I think that the main thing is that if you want to do something, don't wait around, you know. Um, if you're interested in whatever it is, whether it's fucking interpretive dance or pottery or I don't know what the fuck people are into but if you want to do something do it and figure it out as you go because you know if you wait until you're like well I don't want to do it until everything's perfect then you can always find a reason why something's not perfect so I think the act of putting yourself and your work out there is the most important um, even if it's, you know, it's rudimentary or it's flawed or whatever. It's like, that's how you're going to learn. And um, uh, just the act of doing is the most important thing because so many, especially, you know, underground metal records that are classics are sort of musically inept. Uh, you know, they got bad production, you know, and these are records I love. I'm not trashy. And these are records that like, define me as a guy. Like, you know, the first Sodomy P or Welcome to Hell, Recomputer Faction. These are not like musical masterpieces. These are teenagers fucking making a lot of noise. And as long as the energy and the sincerity is there, if you stick with it, the rest will sort of come. So just, you know, just fucking do it and, you know, take advantage of, like I said, there's so many more tools than, than when we were starting out in the early 90s. You know, there's so many more tools now. So take advantage of it and you know, uh, people like me, we love to talk about this shit. You know, God knows my fucking wife and my coworkers don't want to hear about it. So it's like, you know, try to pick people's brain in, in a way that's respectful and, and, you know, just be yourself and, and stick to your guns and work hard. And, you know, then at the very least, even if nothing happens or you don't become, uh, you know, you don't realize your, amb your ambition for your career, you'll have the knowledge that you did something 
for yourself that was real. And that's something nobody can take away. If I was staring down somebody who, who was honestly wanting to know, like, hey, how did, how did you do it? How do you, how do you get up every day and, and, and do it? Um, you know, I would, I would just say, you know, at a certain point, I wasn't afraid to make mistakes. Um, you have to fail a little bit before you can succeed, you know? Um, and we're still failing at some things, you know? I'm still failing at some things in life. Um, but the, the point is, is how you get to a better level and how you level up in general is by getting back up and keeping, keeping the move, you know? Keep it going, um, don't stop, you know? You get discouraged, find that courage and push forward. That's that's really that's that's the only advice I truly have because I can't really tell you how to I couldn't tell somebody how to make a band work. You know, I couldn't tell somebody how to find this person, how to find that person and how to, you know, I, 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 it, there's so many different people. Everyone's different, you know. Every situation's different. The most important thing is consistency and just just loving what you do. You know, loving what you do and pushing forward no matter what. You know, that's the goal. No matter what, push forward. I think before this band, I was in a pretty dark space. Um, you know, I have, I'm 35. Uh, I've been trying to play music, you know, since I was like 16 or 17. So I've done a lot of bands, you know, and a lot of them I put a lot of heart in. I made a lot of mistakes, you know. Um, and I feel like... I feel like right before this band, I was probably at the darkest point because a band that I had worked so hard on was just failed, had failed, and we couldn't keep it together. Um, and I was honestly just close to giving up on life in general. You know, I'd had, I'd had just some very dark thoughts, and uh, you know, it was a very, uh, it was a very scary time. And then, you know. Me and Michael got in times back together and started working on that stuff, and we were having issues, um, you know, getting the recordings out and finishing those. And in the meantime, we decided to push forward with Frozen Soul, and um, you know, it just worked out. You know, uh, things started happening, and it was like this little spark where I'm like, is this like a glitch in the Matrix or something? Like. What is going on? Like people were receiving it really well, and all of our friends were supporting us. And it was like the the thing that I had preached the entire time about, like seeing unity and all this stuff. And it it was like it was real, you know. Um, and I realized that like we just had a dynamic that I didn't have before, you know. Um, and we just we got each other better, and you know then the band just worked, worked together within us as people. Um, and it, life just immediately got better. You know, it got me out of the dark spot. It made me fired up to push harder than ever. I was ready to give up on music. You know, um, I was just like, man, I'm too old. I'm too old. Uh, my back can't take touring, you know, this and that. Now I'm, you know, destroying my back every night and it's still going just fine. You know, um, and, you know, I guess, uh, you know, it's made me a stronger person. It's made me realize that, you know, I'm a lot more capable than I thought I was. And that, you know, that, that you know, positive mental attitude, you know, that Bad Brains likes to talk about so much. And, and you know, Cruel Max like to talk about so much, you know, it's real, you know. And, it, and, and you know, it, uh... It's, it's got me in a much better place now, and I'm loving life, and I'm, you know, living it up while I can, and, you know, loving seeing all the friendly faces and touring the world with my family, you know, it's awesome. If you don't know something, or you're fucking confused or intimidated, if somebody's trying to get you to do something you don't want to do with your fucking band or they want to sign you to their fucking label because they're friends with so-and-so or shit's super cool, ask fucking questions. If you see a band that you like that you know, if they're somewhat approachable or even if not, fucking drop them an email and be like, hey, I'm in this band. We're fucking looking to sign a contract or I, you know, like, I'll tell you, man, when we signed to Earache, like fucking Scott Hall and Chris from Lamb of God, like 
walked us through the contract and they barely knew us, you know? Like, I knew, I knew Pig Destroyer dudes, but, um, you know, it was just really nice, nice of them to be able to, like, they're, like, more than welcome to help a, a young band out. And, and I feel like people should know that, like, you should ask questions and don't just fucking assume that, well, this band signed to that label, so it's probably a good idea. It's not. Ask questions. Figure it out for yourself. Don't be afraid to ask people, even if you think they're untouchable. Maybe they'll, you, maybe you can reach out to them and they'll fucking be like, oh, hell no. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> but yeah, I think, I think about those guys for doing that for us a lot. And, uh, I really appreciate it. Pick a different thing to do. <laughs> it's not fun. No, um, I don't know, man. If if it, this is the way I think it should be, if if you're doing it out of love, and if it's like moving you, if you're not doing it just to go get laid or to go f or to try to make money, like if it's actually, you know, if you see yourself never being able to stop doing this, then go for it. You know. Do whatever you can. If it makes you happy, do it. But if you're doing it and you're not enjoying it, you're doing it just, you know, to be a part of some sort of scene or to impress someone or something stupid like that, like, it's not even worth it, you know? Um, I mean, don't get me, I'm nobody to say anything, you know? Go ahead, do whatever the fuck you want. But if I was trying to give advice, I'd say, definitely do it if it's, you know, if it's something you see, you see yourself doing for the rest of your life, you know? Um, do it, do it from, from the heart, you know, not from like fucking, like trying to fit in or something stupid like that, you know, trying to be just a part of what's going on at the moment. You have to know what you want. I mean, if, I think if you love music and you really want to tour and stuff, the most important things to know, two things. One, music is a business. It's fun, it's super fun, but if you want to tour and like, get where some of these bigger bands are, they're a business and they run their band like a business. Second thing is, be sweet to people. I know it sounds easy, but legitimately, I feel like I've the only reason I've gotten a tour and gotten some of the jobs I've gotten and gotten to do what I've gotten to do is because I'm good enough at drums. Like I get by, but I feel like the reason people even want to tour with me is because I like to have fun. You're you're positive. You lift people up. You know what I mean? If if you can be positive and have fun with what you're doing, I feel like you would get hired even if you're not the best musician. Try to do every job that there is to do inside of a venue and try to do everything that it takes to get these shows going. So I'm saying, like, if you haven't sold merch, you should try it so you see what that's like. If you've never thrown a show, you should try it so you can see what that's like. If, you know, you've never, when it gets to that point where people need tour managers, if you've never managed a tour, you should manage it. You should be a driver on a tour. You should be crew on a tour. You know, you should, I book tours, you know, so it's like, like you should, like smaller bands, DIY bands, like you, you book your own tours, you're getting into the skill set that it takes to do this shit for a super long time. And like, I'm a booking agent for bands, but and I'll work with like smaller DIY bands, but a lot of them, the most successful ones are the ones who went out there and got it for themselves before they asked for help. And so I guess that that's, that's what I would say, like, no one's gonna open the door for you. I don't know, just listen to as much music as you can and try to try to write music and like, you're always gonna fail at it, you know what I mean? You have to, you have, to have like a long time doing it, unless you get like really, really lucky, you know, but I don't know, just try it out. Uh, be in your own bands, make your own music. Don't try to do what anyone else is doing in particular. Do your own thing, but take influence from other bands, you know? There was a time where, uh, like mostly when I was first starting out, uh, you know, before you really get a band, when you're first starting out doing vocals, you just try to learn other songs as best as you can and learn from that. Um, and I always had fun doing that. Like I would learn whole albums and like run through the whole album. And then I eventually found like a microphone and I was like, man, I should record me doing this to like see what it sounds like to see if I suck or not, you know? And um, I, I just had fun doing it and uh, the few years went down the line and I got bored again and was like, you know, I'll do a few covers. Uh, now that things are a little different, I have a better setup, vocals are a little different. Basically, we've learned a lot from touring. Uh, we've got to tour with a lot of uh, bands that we look up to. You know, bands we're influenced by. We got to tour with Cannibal Corpse, 
got to tour Dying Fetus, got to tour with Incantation. Um, just like, and those are older bands, and then touring with, you know, bands that are our peers. Like, we, we learn um, how to be a better band or just be a better, you know, craftsman, whether it's watching bands and watching, you know, being able to, to see them every night and kind of study their songs and learn the little tricks or whether it's just more logistical of like, how do you be a band and uh, stay on tour and be able to function, you know, like we pick up, we pick up tricks from every everybody that we come across, you know. Stage fright is the first thing. Yeah, I get stage fright pretty much every night. All the gigs I've done down the years, I still get it. Nervous wreck, you know what I mean, before I go on stage. And that's, I know what it is. It's because I've got this completely irrational fear that it's not gonna be the best that it can be. You know, when, I, when, when Napalm goes out on stage, I want it to be the absolute representation of Napalm Death. You know, the, the coarseness of it, the abrasiveness of it. It has to be for me. And I just have this irrational fear that it's not gonna be that. Um, and the second thing is, is a more human thing. It's like learning to live with four other people in a metal tube, you know, for weeks on end. You need to be mindful of other people's ways. You know, you have to, you know, you, you, you have to. You have to respect other people's, we're, we're, I mean, we're in a band that has very, I think, specific, you know, the thrust of us is quite specific. But we're all not one person, we're all different people still, so you have to work within that a little bit. And it's, it, that's a good thing. It teaches you, like, a few things. We're still a band because we get along, and, you know, we can put, like, petty differences aside. Like, every band's going to get in fights and, like, crumble, you know, and there's people that, like, continue on just because that's their living or their income or something. But we all love each other, you know. We're all friends. We've we've stuck together and I mean you, you know you pick your battles with that stuff of course you're gonna not get along from time to time but once you get out there and you see that you're like basically started a movement it's hard to get away from it you know and that's what's kept me around we were playing a festival in Guadalajara and uh, you know I had my bullet belt and my sweatbands and stuff in my guitar case whatever and you know they're not live bullets I'm not a, you know um, but we get there and the I get pulled aside in the line and like, oh, what's up with this belt, this and that. And I was like, they're just fake. And I speak very little Spanish. I mean, mostly I know how to, how to talk about food. Um, you know, I live in California, so that's like my, my extent. Sin frijoles or con frijoles or whatever. Anyway, so I'm trying to tell these guys that they're not real bullets, they're replica, you know. And then I was just like, you know what, just take them. You can confiscate them, you can throw them away. Like, it doesn't matter, I can just buy another one at home. It's, it's no biggie. And finally, they're like, well, you're gonna have to spend the night in jail, but you'll get out by like 9 a.m. because th this caliber of bullet is illegal for anyone that's not the police to possess in, the, in the, whatever state Guadalajara is in. I was like, all right, okay, so fuck, we go to jail. And the, also, full credit to the people that were running the festival. They were awesome. They sent somebody down to the jail. They brought me, he's like, here's some food. Like, here's, you know, a couple of Coca-Colas or whatever. And, you know, they were really, really cool. And so I got up. Of course, you know, once you're in the holding cell, it's just like a drunk tank holding cell. It wasn't like jail, jail. But um, my main concern, I was like, well, I don't know who I'm going to be in here with, you know what I mean? Like, is this dangerous? I don't know much about the neighborhood. Is it dangerous? Is it safe? And just two drunk dudes. They were totally cool. Um, I gave them some, like, candy bars or whatever. I was like, here you go, bud. And, you know, we all just sort of slept it off. And the morning came, and I was like, I don't know what time it is, but the time's really passing here. And they pull me out finally, and then, I guess it's like 11. And I was like, okay, cool, cool. And they had me fill out all this shit, sign all this stuff, you know, they're like, this is your passport. Yeah, that's my passport. This is your ID. Okay, cool. And then I'm thinking like, all right, that's it. And they're like, okay, now go back down and wait. And I was like, wait, 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 wait for what? Why? And then they pull me up again. And by now it's like three in the afternoon. And, you know, this is a big festival, like Priest is the headliner. So we're playing at like, you know, 5.30 in the afternoon. And so they pull me up again at like three and I've got... 
uh, our agent on the phone from, from LA and he's like, hey, so the band is freaking out. Like, what do you want them to do? We don't know. Apparently, the, you know, because I, I don't, just don't speak Spanish well enough, they told the promoter that the problem is that they're waiting for a translator. That they, because I don't speak Spanish, legally they have to have a translator come. And there was a bunch of stuff, like they, like on the way to the jail, they took me to a doctor. And I was like, why am I here? And the doctor's like, did they beat you? I was like, no, like what the fuck is going on? He's like, okay, cool, sign this. I was like, All right, they didn't beat me. So it was just a bunch of weird hoops to go through. Anyway, so it's three o'clock and he's like, well, you guys are supposed to play in like two hours. What do you want the band to do? I was like, fucking play, like just play without me because if we don't play, like they're, you know, they might not pay us because we didn't fulfill, that's how it works, you know? So I was like, I'll, I'll do my best to get there, but you know, just have them play without me. And then finally, like by the time we're supposed to go on stage, the translator finally gets to the jail. And the translator is like, this is fucking stupid. Like these bullets are fake. They know the bullets are fake, but because it's the weekend, I'm the only translator working. And there was another thing that I had to do like at the Capitol building, which was across town and traffic. And he's like, yeah, all right, just sign this, sign this. They talk to each other, blah, blah, blah. I finally got out, and, um, I, and then the next thing, I was like, so do I have to pay a fine? Am I going to be allowed back in the country? Do I have a criminal record? And he's like, no, 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 you're all good. It's all good. And so I finally get to the, to the festival, and the band has just finished playing without me like 10 minutes beforehand. And I remember I was, I was coming in, and I, I was very hungry because I, I ate the night before, and they give you like a little bimbo like pastry wrap or whatever. And that's all I ate all day. And I was going in the catering tent, and the lady's like, oh, you need credentials, this and that. And uh, my friend, of course, word has gotten out amongst everybody I know. And, and my friend Ben, that used to play guitar for Carcass, happened to see me and he's like, Right, this man's been in jail all day. He just wants some food, mate. Give him some food. And he sort of berated the woman. She's like, Okay, all right, all right. Just come in and get some fucking food. Anyway, so that was, uh, that was one particular nightmare. <laughs> that is, you know, not too, that doesn't reflect too badly on me as a person being a shithead. <laughs> While I was in jail, first my thought was, you know, I was going to change my strings before the gig. I'm like, am I going to have enough time to change my strings? Then I was like, am I going to be able to play? And then I was like, am I going to be able to get out? Am I going to be able to make my flight the next day? And I was thinking like, okay, so if I can't make my flight, what do I do? Like, what's my game plan? You know what I mean? Like, it went the, so you're just sort of going through these scenarios in your head as you're sitting there, I'm like, who do I fucking call? Because they're not going to let me just sit there and like, you know, call a million people. Like, do I call my mom because my uncle's a lawyer and she can get in touch with him? Or do I call the American, the, I don't know. It didn't come to any of that, but you start, you know, at once the time kept rolling on, because they're like, oh, you'll be out by nine. I was like, bro, it's like fucking a lot later than nine, man. So, yeah, but it turned out okay. So we did a tour of um, uh, Finland, and um, it was uh, that it was light most of the time that you were there. So it was a, a huge adjustment as far as your, like, biological, you want to go to sleep, you know. And, um, and we ended up, one of the places that we were staying was a flop house and they did have a shower but it was there was no heat there was no hot water so we went down because it would have been days that we had, had since we hadn't showered and uh to put the shower head on your head it gave you an instant headache like you were sucking down a like an icy, you know, and you you get the brain for, like it was it's it was so bone chillingly cold. I mean, it had to be one degree above freezing. It was like ice coming out of there, and that was. And then we ended up. I ended up sleeping next to some, what I think were homeless people, uh, which is that's not necessarily bad. But um, we were in this house, and we're we're all sleeping, and there was people upstairs fucking, and. <laughs> Like, I'm trying to sleep, and I was just like, this, what, what am I doing with my life? But anyway, it got better the next day. I call it the, the shit mystery. We were on tour with some bands in Europe, and, you know, four bands in a bus, and last, next to last night of the tour, so it's the two shows left, the night after the, the next to last show, we're at this venue, promoters at the venue really liked us, 
gave us everybody in the tour party like a six foot length of uh, drink tickets. So nobody's, nobody's sober at the end of the night. I go on the bus and the bus just reeks, man. I'm like, whoa, I'm so glad this is the last night I have to spend on this bus. And um, next morning, TM, tour manager, wakes us all up and is like, yo, gotta have a meeting about something. And uh, I guess somebody took a turd off the street or they shit in their own hand or they pulled one out the bowl and they brought it onto the bus and they used their shitty fingers to type on the keypad to get into the bus and threw it in the bunk with somebody in one of the other bands. And they ended up sleeping with it. And they were like waist down, just hovered. And we could not get anybody to fess up for it. One of the bands was like, how do we know you didn't do it? And we're like, our name's on the bill for the bus. Do you think we want to pay fees and stuff? But man, that bus driver was super freaking cool. He was like, look, I'm not going to tell the bus company. Just pay for all the cleaning supplies. I'll clean up the stuff and just throw away the sheets and all that. Max, love you, dude. Varian bus driver, man. That guy's freaking killer. Um, and uh, yeah, so then like people in the scene started hearing about it. And like you get other bands come up. They'd be like, hey, man, who do you think did it? <laughs> who do you think did it? And like, we'd, uh, yeah. A great tour, though, man. That was so many cool times on that, that run. Uh, at the end, it got kind of shitty. So this is with obviously an older old lineup. It was a different drummer that we had at the time, one of my good friends. Um, and uh, so I think it was the first show of our European tour that we had booked, and it was Howfest, this really big festival in France, one of the bigger ones, at least, um, that we were, we were going to play. So we showed up, whatever. Um, we got checked in, went backstage. Um, we were playing quite early. I think we were playing like at noon or something, or maybe one. I'm not too sure, but um, so yeah. So we got backstage, kind of settled for a bit before we were supposed to get ready to go on stage. And like, I played that festival once before, so I, I kind of had an idea what was gonna happen, and so I did. So these two like uh, Jack Daniel people came, and they were like, hey. If you take a picture with us, we'll give you a free bottle of Jack Daniels. And we're like, okay, cool, yeah, fuck yeah, we get to party you now. So we took a picture with them, we got the bottle, we went on stage, played, whatever, the show was great, came back off stage. And right away when we got off stage, we opened the bottle, and we're like, all right, cool, let's take some shots. You know, it was a sick show, we started drinking. And then I think, I don't remember who was after, I think Havoc was after us, and then Vader. So we were drinking backstage for Havoc, and then we're like, hey, we gotta, we gotta catch Vader, so we're like, let's go watch Vader. So uh, we pretty much downed that whole bottle like in 30 minutes between four dudes. So we got pretty wasted, we're walking to go see Vader. We were already fucking, you know, like raging and shit, so once we got to, you know, to start seeing them play, like our drummer is like, he's not good with alcohol. He'll, he, he, he parties and everything, but he like tends to get a little too fucked up and he, can't control himself, so we're like, we already had told him, like, dude, make sure you don't drink too much, because this is a huge festival, and we don't want to fucking lose you. Anyways, we got there, first song um, starts, and our drummer was like, hey, I'm going to go in the pit. I'm like, no, dude, we're going to lose you. That was the last time we seen him. So we didn't see, we didn't see him till, okay, so it came to, like, maybe midnight. And our driver, we had a hotel which was like an hour away drive, driving, and our driver was like, hey, we have a long drive tomorrow. I want to go sleep. Have you found your drummer? And we're like, dude, we can't find him. Like, there's, we've looked everywhere. So, so we're like, you know what, just go. We'll keep looking, and we'll take a taxi or something. We looked till like 2, 3 in the morning. The festival was, I mean, there was after parties and shit, so there was still shit going on, but the festival was pretty much done, and we're walking around this huge fucking festival trying to find him. And, Finally, we thought, of like, hey, what if we just go, like, to the, like, the front gate of the festival, look outside, maybe he's waiting for us outside, so we do that as we're walking up, um, we're walking and we see someone on the floor just, like, laid out, <laughs> so we're like, dude, I bet you that's, that's our drummer, so we, we got there and it was our fucking drummer, he was all fucked up, dude, he was pretty much knocked out, and we're like, dude, we've been looking for you for fucking hours, dude, where the fuck you been? He was pissed, like, fuck you guys, you guys left me, like, like, no, dude, we've been looking for you, like, this whole time, so, <clears throat> anyways, 
we're like, okay, let's go, let's go find a taxi. We gotta, we gotta start going. So we, we found a taxi. The taxi, uh, I think he, I don't remember if he didn't accept cards or what it was, but he wanted cash, and we're like, dude, we only have cards. So he had to take us to this ATM fucking far away, pulled out cash. We didn't get home, we didn't get to the hotel till like, I wanna say like 5.36 in the morning. The, ho- the, the fucking um, taxi drops us off. We're like walking into the hotel, which is like a gate that opens. We're just like, the whole time our drummer was pissed about us ditching him, so he, we could, like he was just talking shit the whole time. Fuck you guys, fuck you guys, this and that and this. So we're, as we were walking in, we noticed that we didn't hear him. Like, what the fuck? He's not talking shit no more. So we look back, and as we look back, dude, our drummer's literally, so we all walked in the gate, and he's like walking out of the gate, gets in this random van, and just takes off. And we're like, what the fuck, dude? We were so fucking, we were like, dude, we, it took us hours to find this dude, and he fucking takes off again. We're like, dude, th- he doesn't have a cell phone, like, there is no way we're gonna find this guy, so we just gave up. We're like, dude, let's just go sleep, and hopefully he gets in, t- in touch with us. Like, th- we don't have no idea where he just went, so. Anyways, we knock out, like, an hour or two later, I just keep, like, I wake up to the fucking phone just going off, like, ringing, 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 I'm like, I wake up, I'm like, what the fuck is going on, right? Like, I thought it was somebody's, like, alarm to wake up back home because we were in Europe different times, whatever. So I told my bass player, like, hey, dude, your fucking alarm's going off. Ask, like, take that shit off. And it was um, somebody calling, uh, so it was a Vader drummer calling him through Messenger. And so he finally picked up. He's like, hey, this is, like, this is so-and-so. Um, your drummer is with us at the train station. He came with us in a taxi, and like he's trying to get a hold of you guys. We're like, what the fuck? So it turns out that I guess us and Vader had the same hotel room, but as they were going to the train station, my, our dumb drummer somehow thought that that was us, and he went in the taxi and got dropped off at the train station, dude. And I mean, that, that's pretty much the whole story, but... It was just a nightmare, dude. We had to go pick him up, and that's kind of how we uh, we we uh, somewhat came friends with the Vader people, the Vader dudes. And um, yeah, luckily they, we were able to fucking get a hold of him because it was literally the beginning of the tour. It was the first show, you know. But yeah, that's my that's my story that always comes to mind when when uh, when somebody asks about a you know a tour story. <laughs> so we had like a member change, and basically it was like, okay, well, too short of notice to have the band that's gonna be playing do it so we got to do fill-ins so i got fill-ins and then uh basically what happened was it was a winter tour so it was snowing we played a show in i want to say it was like indiana or we were going to illinois i know we were going to chicago i think i think we came from indiana or it was wisconsin i'm not sure um <clears throat> but what ended up ended up happening was uh, we were driving and it started snowing while we were driving and it started snowing pretty fast, pretty heavily and we had to get to a gas station that was like a mile away so we were driving and uh, all the cars started losing like the fucking uh, the grip on the road so everybody was slipping and sliding off the road and the van, we were driving slowly too we weren't driving like super fast and the dude that was driving at the time uh, we're going, going, and then we lost grip on the road, and we started drifting, like we're going straight, and we started drifting like this sideways, and he just kind of let it go, which is what you're not supposed to fight it, because if you fight it, you'll flip, especially with a trailer, it'll, it'll, you'll fucking die. Um, so he basically let it go, and we were going slow enough to where we. We weren't, like, flying down the road, you know what I mean? We just kind of, like, drifted, and then we came to a stop because we hit the bank on the side of the road. Super terrifying because when we started drifting, like, the van went weightless, and and we were, like, gonna flip. It was very scary. But aside from that, I mean, there's nothing really that's happened that was like, oh, my God, we almost died. Like, that was, like, the one story that sticks out to me because it was very frightening. So we put on this fest back in July of 2021 called Wrecking Ball Metal Madness. It was supposed to be, like, the live version of this live stream that we did with Devourment and Creeping Death. And then we added some more Texas bands on it, like uh, Tribal Gaze, Flesh Rot, Flesh Hoarder, uh, a bunch of different bands. But... Yeah, that day, uh, a lot of stuff uh, just started like going wrong, like one after another. Um, at least as far as uh, the Frozen Console Camp goes, like our merch was like super, super disorganized. So our merch guy at the time was like kind of scrambling. We feel pretty bad about that. Um, 
that day too, um, for some reason, like the AC in the venue stopped working. And this is like in the middle of Texas summer. So it got like super fucking hot inside. It was way hotter inside than it was outside, even with the sun like blaring down. Um, and we had some issues with security. Um, they weren't like proper security or anything like that. So they were running around kind of like saying, oh, the show's gonna get shut down, blah, blah, blah. There's cops here, the fire department's here. And we're, which didn't happen at all. The show didn't get shut down and it kept going on. But yeah, we ended up, uh, at least for us, we had to cut like half of our set. We were gonna play Crypt of Ice in its entirety, like front to back. We couldn't use samples and we had to cut like half the songs because we didn't know if the show was actually gonna get shut down or not, things like that. But yeah. Uh, really hot in the middle of the venue in Texas summer. Uh, they were charging people for water, which I think is a bunch of bullshit because water should be free at every venue. Um, yeah, it was a, that day was just total chaos, just one thing after another. Oh, and that show too, I ended up fucking my back up really bad because I ended up stage diving during Creeping Death set just because I was like, fuck yeah, let's go. And I just jump off the stage and land on my back. And then next thing I know, my sciatic nerve is just shooting a whole bunch of pain like from my back down all the way through my leg. And so I'd play my set feeling like that too on top of everything else. We played a crazy show in Peru on time. And uh, we had, there was just one of these crazy tours where you gotta fucking fly every day. So like you get off the stage at one in the morning and you have to be at the airport at like six in the morning. So you literally just go to the fucking hotel to shower or whatever, you know? So like, um, we knew we had to be at the airport at a specific time. So we fucking, you know, took like two hours of sleep. We drag our shit down the lobby for the promoter to pick us up and we're just waiting and waiting and fucking waiting and nobody comes and finally this dude fucking comes storming in the, the fucking lobby and he's like sweating and shit and we're like who the fuck are you and he's like he's like I'm sorry we're late I'm we're sorry we're like yeah you better fuck it like we're gonna miss our fucking plane dude like you're fucking up you know and he's like I'm sorry the promoter the guy that we were dealing with all night and hanging out who was supposed to do he's that promoter uh, he he got stabbed like uh like leaving after he dropped you guys off and he's like in the hospital like and we we're like what like like yeah they, they thought he had the money from the show so somebody like followed us and fucking when he dropped us off, fucking followed him home and fucking stabbed him trying to get get the money from the gig. And uh, yeah, we we're all like, we we're all just like in the van on the way to the airport, like, fuck, like, all right, man, so, okay, I, I guess, I guess we'll let it slide. I don't know, like, what are you supposed to say to that? Holy shit, man, it was fucking terrifying. We were in a diner, you know, somewhere like on our way. We weren't even in the town that we were like playing in. And this big guy comes up, you know, clearly a metalhead, comes up to our table and is like, is that your, is that your van outside? You guys on the road? And like, I'm kind of like guarded when people, you know, is that your van? Like, I'm a little bit guarded about that. But we were like, yeah, you know, we're Lord Almighty, we're, we're playing on the road. And he's like, I, I used to, you know, I used to tour, I know what it's like. And he puts a hundred dollars on a table. He's like, breakfast is on me guys. And that, that was it. He didn't stick around like any longer to talk to us. He was just like, walks up, you guys are on the road, he has a hundred bucks, and he left. Like that was, that was like, wow. <laughs> a couple years ago, we were on tour with uh, cattle decapitation and we uh, stopped at a gas station in a uh, rough part of town in the middle of the night. And uh, uh, a gentleman uh, pulled a gun on my uh, drummer and my, uh, my second guitar player. Kyle and I were sleeping in the back of the van and uh, the guy robbed them for just like whatever money they had in their pockets and took their cell phones and then was on his way. And fortunately it didn't go way worse. But uh, it's definitely an eye-opening experience, you know, to uh, really be safe and uh, really pay attention to what, what the fuck you're doing out here, man, because it can be really dangerous. My older band, uh, we played um, a show and it got really late and um, it was insane. Like every single thing was closed and I had to take a shit. And let me tell you, I really had to take a shit. 
it was bad. And I was like frantic. I was going everywhere. I was walking into hotels. I was, nobody would let me use the bathroom. I was going everywhere. Um, I walked for like, felt like two miles and could not find anywhere to go to the bathroom. It was so strange, like the bars, everything was closed and I had no idea why. Um, and, uh, you know, I had also like been drinking a lot. So, you know, probably didn't get to check those places as well as I could have. Um, so what my dumb ass found was a ditch in the middle of downtown Austin. And, uh, I remember like being like, okay, so I'm either going to shit my pants while I'm walking outside or I'm going to go shit in this ditch. So I ran down to the ditch and I shit in that ditch. <laughs> and, okay, yeah, I didn't have any toilet paper or nothing. So I was looking around in the darkness, right, because my phone was dead. I didn't have any light. I'm trying to look for something to wipe my shitty ass with in this ditch in the middle of downtown Austin. I found some caution tape that was in the mud. So I could try to clean it off, you know, the best I could. And uh, I wipe my ass with that dirty caution tape. <laughs> <laughs> Is something fucking dripping on me? It's, uh, I, I was thinking it was drip. I was dripping sweat, but it's dripping on my head. That's, I, was, I was like, I, was, I thought I was sweating, and I'm like, I can't be sweating that fucking much. Doing an interview. Two more questions. <laughs> so I'm just get one out. I'm not a crier, dude. I don't. This guy's like every time I see him, he's crying. Fucking tough as shit, man. What are you talking about? Yeah, I had some beans, so you're in trouble. Yep. Yeah. Some refried be beans. We all have in common that, that unfortunately we're living here on this earth. So that's, that's one thing that we all have in common. Before the band, I was nothing. I was just a blob of, of just non-existent, a, 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 a waste of my dad's sperm laying on the ground. But since I discovered heavy metal, I've turned into a, 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 a Rob Halford, Udo Dirkschneider loving human. Just go back to the caveman days. You, you, want, you want to have something to grab onto to procreate, right? If you're not grabbing onto anything, what are you doing? You're, you're, you're wasting your time, you're wasting your sperm. Smoke weed and listen to Napalm Death and Mayhem. Metal, Satan, goodbye.